pregnancy is, so Michael okay. may have to. Uh, okay, I'll we'll worry about it tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Did you head north? I did not. No. Uh, next this month. Yeah. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. Oh, hey, there's all our friends. I'm the last one. The last time that happens. <laughs> Some days, it happens. Do you, either of you participate in the National Lab? If so, could I ask you to email your schedule so that we could uh, get some footage of you uh, participating tomorrow night? Yes, I will. Thank I will you. send you the footage. I will send you the uh, schedule. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> that means I have to put together a schedule. <laughs> Charlie's got a whole mess. I, I took a picture of it. Because he has oh, so... schedule. What, what happened? What'd I say? Took your schedule. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't need that. Thanks for letting us know. Right, take this off. <clears throat> Microphones are on. Hello, friends. Okay. Vivian Cruz O'Doherty. Got it, Vivian. Um, I need to reschedule a couple of our meetings coming up. Okay. Um, we haven't had one in a while. Yeah, so... Let's schedule a, a, a lunch yeah. and then... Okay, we so we're supposed to meet out. next Thursday, but I can't do next Thursday. I could do Wednesday or Tuesday. I could do Wednesday or Tuesday. Julie, do we have a regular... Hmm? Do we have something regular set up for this month? We do. We have, we have a one-on-one -on -one schedule for tomorrow at noon. Was it for this meeting? I thought it was for next time. On our calendar? It is now. You've been invited. I'm there. <laughs> I'm make it happen. This Thursday? No, next Thursday the 16th, 16th is what's on the calendar. Tom? Okay. We're moving that to Tuesday the 21st or Tuesday the 14th. I was thinking about the 14th. Is that good? Okay. We're going to have lunch at noon. Good evening. Well, let me at least stop by the meeting. I'd like to call the, this meeting of Durham City Council to order <clears throat> for Monday. August the 6th, 2018, 7 o'clock p.m., and certainly want to welcome all of you all in attendance and very glad to have you here tonight. Uh, I would like you now to please join me in a moment of silent, silent meditation. Thank you. I would like to recognize now Councilmember Reese to please lead us in the Pledge to the Flag. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate that. Uh, good evening, everyone. If uh, you're able to do so and if it's your practice, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Councilmember Reese. Uh, and now, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. And Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, introduce the ceremonial items for tonight. Uh, we will start with the um, Breastfeeding Awareness Week proclamation, and I'm going to ask Councilmember Caballero if she could do the honors. Good evening. Um, I'd like to ask Dolly Reeves to come forward as well. Come on up, Dolly. And whoever came with you, yeah. I don't have their names, so I apologize. And now I'll read the proclamation. 
Whereas families are a priority in Durham and ensuring they receive community support to develop and sustain healthy lifestyles with help, which help them to achieve, thrive. And whereas according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, America Dietetic Association, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, America Academy of Family Physicians, World Health Organization and other leading health organizations, breast milk is the optimal food for infants, and whereas a parent's decision to breastfeed should be supported by their family, workplace, community, and whereas the Mayor's Council for Women was established to improve the opportunities and quality of life of all women and girls in the city of Durham, and whereas by providing a supportive and welcoming environment, a breastfeeding friendly community encourages all families to continue breastfeeding. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do you hereby proclaim the City of Durham to be a breastfeeding-friendly community in Durham and hereby urge all residents and community institutions to support and encourage breastfeeding. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, for the sixth day of August, 2018. And now, if I would like I would first like to thank Love Anderson and uh, the La Letter League group of Durham over here for coming forward to the Mayor's Council for Women to um, ask for this proclamation. Uh, just a few years ago, I was a breastfeeding peer counselor in a local WIC department. And uh, as becoming part of that position, you go through a training with, um, with the lactation consultant before you get the job. And, Little did I know at the time, I would be uh, mentored by a well-known person in the breastfeeding community, Norma Escobar. I just wanted to briefly read off something that she wrote in light of World Breastfeeding Week. She said, it's World Breastfeeding Week, and I've been thinking about how breastfeeding and prayer are a lot alike. Both are sacred and common activities. Some people only do them in private spaces. Others are comfortable in public. Some will follow prescribed routines. Others go with the flow. When done in certain spaces, both activities are bound to draw attention and offend. There are always someone, there is always someone there telling you how you should do it, and the world could certainly use more both. Happy World Breastfeeding Week. Uh, I thought that was a beautiful sentiment. Um, I don't want to say anything further. I would love to pass the mic off to Love. Thank you. I'm uh, Love Anderson. I'm a mom here in Durham, a local LH League leader, and a serving board member for the North Carolina Breastfeeding Coalition. And I would like to thank everyone in Durham for helping us. Many people don't realize how this saves babies' lives. I just was able to speak to another mother about her journey through breastfeeding as she struggled not to be able to breastfeed her first to breastfeed her second shortly, and to finally be able to master breastfeeding with her third. She cried with me as she talked about the death of her first baby to SIDS. She knows more now, and she mourns that she was not able to breastfeed her child, wishing that, hoping maybe that that would have made things different. It's my dream that every parent in Durham is able to achieve their personal infant nutrition goals. Breastfeeding is the first thing we often do as a mother, and it's my hope that every woman will be able to do it the way that they want to do it. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Uh, before we, uh, we have one item that's going to be on the consent agenda tonight, which is the CEDAW re resolution. <clears throat> and we haven't had a chance to read that yet, so I am going to ask the Mayor Pro Tem if she would uh, proceed to the microphone and uh, read this resolution and, and that she might ask those present uh, for this resolution to come forward. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, could the folks who are here to receive this resolution join me at the podium? Resolution of the City of Durham in support of the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW. Whereas the cities and counties on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, CEDAW, was originated from the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, 
which was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on December 18, 1979, became an international treaty as of September 3, 1981, and has been ratified by 186 UN member nations. And whereas CEDAW provides a comprehensive framework for local governments to examine their policies and practices <coughs> in relation to women and girls, and to rectify discrimination based on gender, and whereas although women have made major gains in the struggle for equality in most fields, much more needs to be accomplished to fully eradicate discrimination based on gender. And whereas women generally earn less than men in the city of Durham, women and girls are more likely to be victims and survivors of intimate partner violence, and women face inequities and comprehensive access to comprehensive health care. And whereas CEDAW has proven effective in many counties and cities as a mechanism to advance gender equality, and whereas more than 30 cities and counties across the nation are engaged with this national campaign, including Pittsburgh, Washington, D.C., New York, Salt Lake City, Louisville, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Durham County. And whereas the Durham Mayor's Council for, Wom for Women can act as an oversight body for gender analysis and will be supported by the Durham City Council in their creation of a report on the status of women and girls. And whereas the Durham City government has an appropriate and legitimate role in affirming the importance of the principles of CEDAW in the city of Durham and using them as a guide for public policy. And whereas the city of Durham has a demonstrated commitment to women's rights and full equality. Now therefore be it resolved that the city of Durham hereby supports the Cities for CEDAW initiative and is committed to eliminating all forms of violence against women and girls, to promoting the health and safety of women and girls, and to providing equitable access to educational, social, economic, and cultural opportunities in the city of Durham. Thank you very much. I am inspired tonight by passage of CEDA because I know what does that mean? It is not just a piece of paper that the city council members and the mayor has agreed to pass it. The CEDA at the local level has three components. CEDA means women's human right to be implemented at the local level. Passage of this resolution inspires me because all the elements are already in place in Durham. We have advisory board, advisory women board council in place that they will conduct gender analysis and they collect data and information with the help of North Carolina Coalition for CEDA members and they provide annual report to the city council members so to bring to their attention the challenges that women are facing in Durham. And I am sure, I am inspired because I am sure about the commitment of our city council members and the mayor and having the championship of Gillian with us, I am sure that all together we can make a difference in Durham and we will improve the, the status of women. Having said that, we need to recognize that Durham is one of the most progressive cities in North Carolina, but that's why we started to run this project in Durham, because Durham community will be the model for all other cities across North Carolina and even in Southern United States. We are moving from Durham to Greensboro and to Martin County as a next step because we see all the elements are in place and gives us assurance that implementation of CEDA will continue with the support of our city government. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much. All right, thank you and thank you Madam Mayor Pro Tem. <coughs> Uh, we are now uh, ready for announcements by members of the council. Are there any announcements by members of the council? <coughs> Councilmember Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I wanted to share some exciting news that um, Wallet Hub uh, financial management website uh, recently ranked uh, 150 of the largest cities in the United States based on their operating efficiency. Um, their research included cities like Portland, Oregon, 
uh, Austin, Texas, Miami, Florida, uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, and I'm pleased to share that Durham was ranked seventh uh, out of those 150 cities ahead of all the cities I just mentioned and so many more. Um, that alone is impressive. I think it's also additionally impressive given that according to this ranking, Durham has the 12th largest budget per capita of any city on that list. So um, the scope of the work that, we, that the city uh, does is big, uh, and the expectations are certainly high, both inside the city and out. Um, but I think that this demonstrates that uh, those expectations in large part are being exceeded, um, and that the work of the city is being done in a, in a truly exceptional way. So I just want to congratulate Thank you very much. Uh, City Manager Bonfield and every member of our staff. Um, so. You're here. Thank you. Thank you, Member Council. Thank you, Council Member Alston. Any other announcements? Any other announcements? Uh, I have two very brief ones. One is, as you all know, um, a great friend of the city of Durham, uh, Dr. Fail Wynn, passed away recently. And I spoke about Fail at our, at our work session. Um, and I just want to say that um, we all mourn his loss, and we will be uh, honoring him uh, in a, a bigger way at, a, at an upcoming city council meeting, uh, probably in early September, along with his wife, Peggy. And I just wanted to let folks know that. Uh, we mourn his loss. He was a tremendous leader here in our city and uh, in his last days was working very hard uh, in so many ways to improve life here in the city of Durham. And we will miss Dr. Wynn, and we look forward to honoring him uh, very soon in these chambers. I also wanted to welcome tonight uh, a group of uh, folks that I have just spoken to this evening before the meeting uh, who are from various countries uh, in North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, from there, We have Israelis, we have Palestinians, we have Lebanese, Tunisians, Moroccans, Jordanians, and I think I missed one or two. Algerians, Algerians thank you. And I just want to say, uh, they, they're here, they're in, they, they, are in, they work in the private sector, they work in various NGOs, they work in government. They're here for a program at Duke University where they will be for several weeks and then go, I believe, to Washington, D.C. for several more weeks uh, to study government and civil so society in our country. Uh, and we're very glad to have you uh, and welcome you to our council chambers. We know that you won't be able to stay the entire meeting, so we'll leave whenever it gets boring. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, we're, but we're very, very, very glad to have you. Any further announcements? All right, then uh, we'll move to priori priority items. Mr. Manager, any priority items? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, no priority items from the City Manager's Office this evening. Thank you so much. Mr. City Attorney? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On agenda item number 27, zoning map change, Rollingdale. Um, based on the conversation that we had at our last council meeting before the break, um, I did have a conversation with the county attorney, uh, which I will share the upshot of that with you uh, when we get to that item. Thank you very much. Do we need a motion on that item? I do not. All right. Uh, Mr. Attorney, happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 29 years old. <laughs> I'm pleased that the guest from Algeria came all the way to uh, <laughs> celebrate that with me. So thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, Madam Clerk, any priori priority items? Good evening, Mayor and Council. No items. Thank you very much. All righty. Uh, we will now move to the consent agenda. Um, The next order of business is the consent agenda, and all items on the consent agenda will be approved by a single vote unless an item is removed by a council member or a member of the public for separate consideration at the end of the meeting tonight. I'm now going to read each of the consent agenda items. Let me just look here for a second. I do have some speakers on. Um, okay. All right. Uh, for the consent agenda, item one, Durham Board of Adjustment Appointments. Item two through five can be found on the general business agenda. Item six, the Durham Homeless Services Advisory Committee appointment. 
Item seven, the city county ICMA local government management fellow interlocal agreement. Mm -hmm. Item eight, resolution of the city of Durham in support of the committee on the elimination of discrimination against women or CEDAW. Item nine, pre-development grant agreement with the housing authority for DHA downtown and neighborhood planning. <laughs> Item 10, uh, we are going to pull, we have a speaker, uh, contract for neighborhood bicycle routes design, TIP number C56051. We'll be pulling that for consideration at the end of the meeting. Uh, item 11, FY 2019 agreement with North Carolina State University for the development, enhancement, and maintenance of the Triangle Regional Model. Item 12, Durham Beltline, EB 5904 Supplemental <laughs> Municipal Agreement. Mr. Mayor, is that item pulled? Yes, and, and we, have, we have speakers on that. Mm -hmm. Item 14, May 2008, so, so we'll be pulling item 12. Uh, item 14, uh, May 2018 bid report. Item 15, June 2018 bid report. Item 16, construct and contract with Rustin Paving Company, Inc. for asphalt paving at multiple park sites. Item 17, proposed sale of foundation encroachment easements to Durham ID P1 owner 2 LLC. Item 18, algal flowway site selection and preliminary design project and presentation. Item 19, contract amendment number one with MA Engineering Consultants, Inc. for utility locate tax services. Item 20, utility extension agreement with the Miracle League of the Triangle, Inc. to serve Miracle League at American Tobacco. Item 21, Munis Software Annual Soft Support and License Agreement for 2019. <coughs> item 23 to 28, these items can be found on the general business agenda public hearings. And item 33, this item can be found on the general business agenda public hearings. You have heard the consent agenda, uh, and uh, I will accept a motion to approve the agenda with the exception of items 10 and 12. I move approved. Second. Moved and seconded that we approve the <coughs> consent agenda. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. <coughs> Council, the motion is passed 7 0. Thank you very much. We will now move to the general business agenda. Uh, item two, participatory, participatory budgeting steering committee appointments. Uh, let me just explain uh, that as my colleagues in the administration are aware, uh, at the work session, uh, two of our members were away and uh, at uh, National League of Cities. And those of us who were there uh, voted for the participatory budgeting committee uh, and it is our tradition that if people get a majority of the council at the work session to put those, put the members who have been approved on any appointment just on the consent agenda for this meeting, because we know they already have a uh, majority of, of the uh, of the body. Uh, we, however, subsequent to that meeting, our two members who were at the National League of City Council members Freeman and, and Middleton were able to also cast their votes, uh, and. Uh, it turned out that we now have filled the 15 uh, spots that we uh, are that that we have allotted for this committee, five from each of the three wards, uh, and and uh, I would say by good fortune or amazing intelligence on the part of this group, and I think I'll go with the latter. Mm. Uh, we have filled the 15 positions, uh, each person getting four votes or more, but we now need to approve that slate. The members are listed here on your agenda, but. Um, yeah, and so each of these people has received at least a majority of our of our group, and I'm going to ask for a motion that we approve the participatory budget participatory budgeting steering committee appointments. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Any discussion of the approval of these appointments? I just want to uh -huh. thank you guys for uh, holding the, the slots open and not going through the whole process without us here, so. Glad to do it. Really appreciate that. Glad to do it, and I'm glad it worked out the way it did. It, it worked out very fortuitous. Yes, it did. I was worried a little bit that we were gonna have a little- uh, You and I both. Little bureaucratic stuff to do tonight, but we don't, which is nah, awesome. Nah, nah. No, nah, a piece of cake? Okay. Nah, um, <laughs> any more discussion? Moved and All right, uh, if not, uh, we have a motion to, to approve these 15 members of the Participatory Budgeting Committee, and I'm gonna ask Madam Clerk to please open the vote. <coughs> Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0.
Thank you very much. We'll now move to item five, Audit Services Oversight Committee appointment. And let me again explain, uh, we, this was a, a position uh, that is to be held for someone uh, to serve on our Audit Services Committee who has certain uh, financial expertise. We had one applicant, and before approving it, we wanted to make sure that this applicant was a person who was qualified. We asked Jermaine Brewington of the Audit Services Department to um, ask uh, other members of the committee to uh, look at this person's qualifications, and they felt good about this person's qualifications. Uh, and that was something we wanted to do before approval tonight. So given the um, given that vetting by the members of the Audit Services Committee, uh, I will now ask for a motion to approve uh, this appointment. So moved. Second. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move to our general business agenda public hearings, and we will start with item 23, the resolution approving the issuance by the Public Finance, thank you, Authority of its Education Revenue Bonds Excelsior Classical Academy Series 2018. And we will now hear the report from the administration. Good evening, Mayor, members of City Council, uh, David Boyd, Finance Director. This is a public hearing being held pursuant to the Federal Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act to consider a resolution approving the issuance of tax exempt bonds by the Public Finance Authority of the State of Wisconsin for the benefit of Excelsior Classical Academy in an amount not to exceed $20 million. The bonds do not constitute a debt of the city of Durham, nor does the city have any obligation to repay any of the bonds. The council is hearing this item as a federal requirement for them to access the tax exempt market in order to achieve a lower cost of funds. Details of the item have been provided to you previously, but uh, staff and members, uh, representatives of the school are here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Boy. Um, you have heard the report of staff. Are there any questions by members of the council at this time for our staff? I do have one. I know that in the past, um, some of this bond financing has gone to the county commission for their approval rather than council. Is there a reason that it came to us rather than the county commission? Uh, yes, there is, Mr. Mayor. Um, within the past year, the county has um, adopted a policy that any of these hearings for um, for projects that are located within the city limits, uh, they are asking that the city council hear those, while as any projects that would be located in the county, they will hear. Thank you very much. Any other questions for staff at this time? Is, um, just one question. Is this only going through the finance department, or is there other staff involved in this? The, the finance department and the uh, city attorney's office were involved in, in putting the agenda item together. Thank you. I don't believe I've opened this public hearing. Uh, we've heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, and um, let's see. Let me see if there are any speakers. I do not see anyone has signed up to speak on this item. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? Uh, that we may have questions for members of the school uh, community who are here tonight, but is there anyone who would like to speak on this item prior to that? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, I'm going to ask council members uh, if you have any questions or comments that you would like to make at this time. Mr. Mayor, I have a question for staff. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how these uh, bonds work to the extent that you know? I have I thought I heard you to say that the bonds would be issued in the state of Wisconsin, and then something about a market. Can you help me understand that? Um, actually, it may be easier for the bond council from the school to give you a little bit of background about how that works. Good evening. My name is Mary Nash Rusher. I'm a lawyer with McGuire Woods in Raleigh. We are bond council to the school in this transaction. Um, these bonds that are being issued are what we call conduit bonds. That is, you have a governmental issuer who issues the bonds and turns around and lends the proceeds to the school. The school is completely responsible for paying the bonds back. Um, 
In this instance, the school has elected to use an issue, a, a nationwide issuer, public finance authority. They are located in Wisconsin, but they issue bonds across the country. Um, rather than using a North Carolina issuer, the primary reason to select that issuer is that the North Carolina uh, Capital Cities Finance Agency, which is the North Carolina issuer, has a very strict limit of a 20-year maturity. Um, the proceeds of these bonds are being used to acquire the building in which the school is located and then to add on to it, which is a 40-year asset. And so in order to get um, better use of cash flow, the school really wanted a longer maturity and the, the agency uh, will not permit a maturity beyond 20 years. So that was the reason for using a different issuer. Regar can I? Please. Regardless of whether or not the issuer were in Wisconsin or North Carolina, would a governing body, either be at the city council or the county commission, have to uh, go through the process we're going through right now? So if the North Carolina Capital Facilities Finance Agency were the issuer, um, the governing body that approves those issues is actually the governor. So the public hearing would be held at the agency level, and then either the General Assembly or the governor would, would approve, and um, typically these goes to the governor. <coughs> so the only reason this is before us is twofold. Number one, because the borrower, uh, the issuer of the bonds is out of state. That's right. And number two, because it's in the city of Durham and, and not exclusive of, it's not in the county uh, portion that's not in the city. Yes, sir. Um, can you talk, you may not be uh, prepared to talk about this, but can you tell me what kind of, like what's gonna be, what's gonna, why are, what are they gonna do with the money? I know you, you said briefly, you're gonna buy the building and expand it. Um, does that mean that more kids are going to be going to the school? Um, I don't, I, I have representatives from the school who can talk about the charter and how many students the charter permits, but they do have a um, charter that permits an expansion of the school, and so they are adding, they're adding students year by year as they grow. But it is all within the charter that was granted by the North Carolina State Board of Education, which is what sets the limit on the number of students. Ms. Nasher, Ms. Nasher? Rusher. Rusher, actually. I'm sorry. Ms. Rusher, I think you have reinforcements on that question as well. So would you like to come and, I and do. also answer uh, Council Member Reese? Hi, I am Cynthia Godol, the Executive Director of the school. Um, what was the question that you just asked? What are, what are y'all going to do with this money? Um, we are purchasing the building that we have been leasing for the past three years. Um, in order to be able to, um, well, we've been expanding within the building as we grow. Our charter, uh, start. we started off as a K through four school and um, the charter is for a K-12 school. So we add a grade a year, so we expand each year and we have been upfitting the building that someone else owns and increasing the value of the building um, and so we would rather increase the value of our own building and um, be able to expand um, our own facility. Uh, it's also more cost effective for us to uh, purchase the building instead of lease it. Um, the, the payment, the monthly payment will be smaller. And um, as a charter school, we have to pay for our own building unlike district schools. Um, and so that comes to about 25% of our budget, which means that it's difficult to pay teachers enough. Um, so the purpose of trying to have this, you know, be a 40 year bond instead of, uh, or a 30 year bond instead of 20 years is so that we can have a better cash flow to be able to pay our teachers better. <laughs> Um, but we are not, in purchasing this building, we are not expanding beyond what our charter says. We have always, we will do that whether or not, you know. Of course. That's, that, so. you're not breaking the law. I appreciate that. That's great. <laughs> well, um, no, it's not but, that. It's yeah. that we are not growing beyond expectations. 
that have always been there with our charter. So, Thank you. It does not mean we're going to be bigger than we expect it to be. Other questions? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to have a, a follow-up question for our city attorney. We had um, uh, had a short, brief email exchange about this question, and I wanted to follow up with you about um, there were kind of two remaining points, the practical effect of not approving the request and whether that decision is discretionary or if findings of fact are required. Um, if you had a, a thought or response to those questions, thanks. Sure. Uh, we did take a look at that uh, question, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I find no authority that requires us to approve this. In fact, uh, check with the bond council. I think there are multiple uh, agencies that, that could uh, approve this. It could be done by the county. The only reason that it's here is because the county is no longer accepting them. There's no law that says uh, that the county couldn't do it, and I believe the state could do it um, as well, since they're also part of the state, of the county, and of the city. Um, so there's no requirement um, uh, that you do it, and the, the practical effect of, of that, I'm, I'm not sure, other than it is part of the rules of this process that they get um, uh, approval of the resolution through um, an agency that they, that they uh, are a governing agency that they reside in. So, so one of the three, and there may be others, I'm not exactly sure um, uh, that would do that. And, and I'm not aware that you need to make findings of fact. It's just a, uh, it's, your, it's within, it appears to be within your discretion. Thank you. Any other questions, Madam Mayor Pro Tem? No, thank you. Right. Council Member Freeman? I just, I just had a question about the population of the school. So you mentioned not expanding your current population, I'm assuming is middle school, elementary? Uh, currently it's K-7. K-7, okay. We will eventually be K-12. Okay, and can you, t can you speak to the breakdown of how that works? Like is it like 20 kids per class or? It's 24 students per class. We have four sections per grade. And what about your ethnic and racial breakdown? Um, last year's figures I know, this year I'm not sure of yet, but uh, we were about, uh, I think it was 52% um, white, and I'm trying to remember all the figures. Um, we were about 11% Latino, um, about 29% African American, and um, we have a, I think it's about 9% uh, mixed, um, multiracial, um, and whatever else is left. <laughs> and I, just speaking specifically to that breakdown, it's heavily a Caucasian or white school. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, conversations around racial equity in your school? Um, yes, and we actually do um, specifically, um, our board is very diverse and we are specifically marketing to uh, ethnic diversity. And I think actually, um, you know, there are charter schools that are predominantly white, there are charter schools that are predominantly minority. Uh, we actually have more of a mix than most schools in this area do. If I, could, if I could add to that. My name is Mark Simmons. I'm the chair of the board of the school. Um, just to add a little bit to that, we, we track towards or we have a goal of mimicking the uh, racial breakdown of Durham, of the city of Durham. And so as she mentioned, there are marketing initiatives that we have to reach the pockets of the population within the school that are underrepresented so that we can try to get that representation up. But a lot of what happens is based on the school being on a lottery system. So we can't control who, uh, who applies to the school. And it's all done in a blind fashion. It gets accepted by a computer program. So it just so happens that the majority of the applicants happen to be Caucasian. And we're trying to get those other numbers up into the pool so that they can distribute throughout the lottery system. Can I also act? I'm sorry. Please go ahead. A follow-up to the on the on the side of faculty staff, what the breakdown might be on that as well. I did not realize I would have to have these figures, but um, we do have um, 
might be able to pull it up on my phone. I've reported it to the board before, but we, we do strive on our board, on our faculty, um, on our staff, we do strive to have a good ethnic mix and racial mix. Um, so if you need me to, I can look up the figures. Do you want me to do that? All right, hold on. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I also have a few uh, questions. Other questions? By council members, Council Member Caballero. I'll wait until. Okay. Other questions or comments for the bond council or Mr. Simmons? I'll just comment about the, the bond council. I'm sure you're a very good bond council because my brother was a partner at McGuire Woods for 30 years. So I'm sure you're excellent. Thank you. So these are figures from uh, March of 2018. So sex breakdown, 11 males, uh, 48 female, 0% American Indian, 31% African American, sorry, 31% African American, 2% Asian, 60% Caucasian, 4% Hispanic or Latino, and 4% two or more race categories. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. You're welcome, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember, go ahead. Oh, so, so I'm just trying to cross reference. You said 31% African American. So I'm assuming some of those are uh, African American male teachers, and some of them are African American female teachers. And then I didn't catch the, I saw two, two and six. I didn't, I'm sorry, I wasn't moving as fast as you. Uh, was it two percent Asian, which represents one one teacher? Okay. And there's 4%, 4% Hispanic or Latino and 4% two or more race categories. So you don't have any, any teachers that are not of color? Sorry? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's the first one, sorry. Oh, 60% Caucasian or white. I'm sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Freeman, any other questions this time? I'll, look, I'll, I'll okay. wait on the rest. Councilmember Caballero and then Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, sir. Uh, out of curiosity, how long has your school been open? Uh, this is our fourth year. Fourth, is that what you, okay. And then uh, do you offer free print transportation? I'm sorry? Do you have a bus of free print transportation? We do have busing, and we do have free lunch, and we do have uniform assistance. Councilmember Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. I want to... Um, Firstly, uh, self-identify as a, a former member of the Board of Directors of Excelsior, a classical, a classical academy. The information is already in the public domain, but I, before I vote um, for this resolution, I want to share that. I was actually one of the founding members. I helped to write the founding documents, and when I was approached to be a part of the board, uh, the two things I told them that were absolutely non-negotiable was that they had transportation uh, and lunch uh, for their students. It's good to see all of you. Um, <laughs> We're not, I'm, I'm gonna support the resolution. And I, I um, this is a tempting, I think, time to use this as a foil uh, for the larger philosophical conversation about charter schools. And it's a conversation we need to have. Uh, and I welcome it. Um, I, I went to uh, the public school I was supposed to go to in Brooklyn, I did not go to because my mom charterized another public school and pulled me out of my district she, I don't know how she did it. Uh, uh, I won't speak too long on it. Finagled and got me out of my one district to go to another. Um, am I, it, so I, I understand the, 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 um, the passion around this issue. I've sat in so many IEP meetings as a, an advocate for students, usually young black men with a single mom. Um, and I've gone to a lot of suspension hearings and I've looked at a lot of desperate parents who while we who are already matriculated and have degrees have debated the philosophical components of charter schools, each year another class is being graduated or promoted, many of them can't read. So this is a very real issue for a number of people that for many of us that have the luxury of debate, there are young people, a lot of them who look like me, um, who, are, who are just moving through the system and parents are desperate. Um, 
to get their kids in the best situation. So we're not going to spend any money as a city. Um, this is not about granting this school's uh, charter. This school is already functioning. It's already serving our children. There are Bull City children, Durham children that are already attending it. Um, I understand the, the questions about uh, uh, charter schools, um, but for me, this issue isn't really about uh, the overall philosophical argument about charter schools, which we need to have, absolutely. Um, this is about a school that's already open, that's already functioning, uh, that has many of our students, our, and I stress our students, uh, Durham young people attending it, um, who want to do some things for them. Um, I'm voting for this resolution, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Other comments, other questions at this point? I have a few. Um, can you, um, I, I've seen the, uh, the school identified as a Team CFA school. Could you comment on what that means? Uh, team CFA is a network of charter schools. Um, there was a family that donated a lot of money to improve education. It is not a CMO. We do not give them any money. Um, they have given us some grants, um, and it allows us to, instead of operating all by ourselves, have a network of schools to talk with and um, to, uh, you know, try to solve problems with and so on. Um, but that's all it is. Yeah. I have, I know that Team CFA, and uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to comment on this, but I'll tell you something that, that gives me concern is that Team CFA uh, lobbied in the legislature for the Innovative School District, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, as you're probably aware, is a statewide school district, which uh, through that, uh, the state was going to take over potentially two of our Durham public schools, elementary schools. Mm -hmm. uh, this was very troubling to many of us, mm -hmm. myself included. That didn't end up happening, but of course, they did take over a Robeson County school, and uh, which is now managed by Team CFA, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I am I, I have a lot of concerns about this. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Any comments or any way no, you would see that, that related to your school or not? Go ahead. I think it's important to make the distinction that Team CFA, while they offer support through these grants and training for the teachers to improve their skills, et cetera, they don't do and they don't have any management power over the school. The school is completely controlled by the school board. And while there are there is one team CFA representative on the school's board, he's in the minority completely. Um, so it's just the important takeaway is that the school controls itself. The school is managed on its own and is not influenced or in any other manner controlled by Team CFA. And, and, and the school is a local nonprofit board? Yes. Uh, I would just like to add that uh, this is a direction Team CFA has taken since we became a Team CFA school. It was not something we had anything to do with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Councilmember Austin? Just to clarify, thank you. Um, the Team CFA member that's on your board is a full member, a voting member? Yes. Thank you. Councilmember Caballero? Now that there has come to light, at least in North Carolina, what Team CFA has been doing in our local community or our local education community, have you all considered separating yourself from them as a parent organization and finding a, and finding another organization who's, uh, quite frankly, whose politics aren't as problematic? Um, we have a forgivable loan from them at this point. If we disassociated, we would have to pay that back. Um, but in, um, in the first three years, we got one each year, and uh, this is our fourth year. So the first year will be forgiven. Um, in, the second, in the fifth year, the second year will be forgiven. And in the sixth year, the third will be forgiven. But it would be, um, it would 
be difficult to have to pay that back. <laughs> so right now we are not considering it Thank for you. the time being. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Mr. Mayor, if I might. Yeah, sure, Mark. Um, and, and the members, thank you, Mr. Mayor, the members of the um, CFA, um, the um, Excelsior uh, staff will attest to this. I had many knock down and drag out fights um, with the CFA folk, oftentimes on issues in politics that had nothing to do with the school. Um, many, and they're, and they're well documented. Um, one of the assurances that uh, the threshold of assurances that had to be crossed for me was that the school would be locally controlled. Um, and I, I remember saying to uh, uh, one of their, uh, their officials, I said, if you want to write us a check and send it to us and let us determine how we run things, so be it. Uh, but if it's not going to be that way, then, then we're going to have some issues. Um, again, this, this is... I want to, the scope of our decision tonight is, is this resolution, and I, I know, as I've said before, that this is, it's tempting to use this as a foil, I think, to have the larger conversation about charter schools, which we need to have, um, but I, I just want to make sure that we're not um, muddying the issue that is before us um, tonight, um, which is, this is a school that is open now, it's functioning now. It's serving Durham residents and citizens right now. And I think that we ought not lose that. And, and, and let's, let's have a debate about um, um, schools and, and charter schools versus traditional schools. It's interesting. Uh, usually in this chamber, when issues of education come up, this, this body is somewhat reticent uh, to, get this, to take a deep dive on education because it's not within our purview. Um, so it's, it's, it's rather interesting tonight that, that we're, we're doing precisely what, you know, what, what I indicated. That I think we're using this as a foil to work out um, the philosophical debate on charter schools. I don't think this is the appropriate issue. Um, not, and I think there are good the, the arguments uh, and, and, and there's much merit to the debate on um, what's being said here tonight, but I, I think in fairness, quite honestly, this issue uh, is is very uh, specific, and the scope is determined. The scope has been set, and uh, I think we should act on the resolution uh, for what it's worth and for what it contains. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments? Any other comments, Council Member Alston? Thank you. I'll I'll just confess. I'm I'm struggling with this um, decision. Um, but because it, it's hard to ignore um, what, what I see as a threat that our that charter schools play um, to the resources and talent and stability of our public school system, and it's hard for me to disassociate um, that issue um, from this from this item that's before us. Um, I I do kind of in light of that um, help me understand if if this resolution were to not pass. Um, and you say weren't able to have these funds accessible to purchase the building and to expand in the ways that you, you know, ideally want, kind of what's plan B? Like if, if you, to the extent you can, if you aren't able to purchase it with these, these funds, do you have one? Um, so at this point, the school already actually has an interim loan that it has used to purchase the building. It had to do that in order to get the renovations done because the school year started on August the 1st. And so um, they own the building. They would then have to refinance. That's an interim financing, um, lining up the permanent financing. They would then have to go get a taxable loan to do that, which would just cost more and would, would just be more operating dollars going to bricks and mortar and less to uh, resources for running the school. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Council Member, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and then Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also find this issue very complicated. Um, I, as a parent, um, feel very strongly that like that I understand why parents in this community um, want to pursue the best possible educational outcomes for their children. 
Um, and I, as a parent, also want to pursue the best possible educational outcomes um, for my own children. But I don't think that we can ignore the larger social impacts of that decision and that we as a body could ignore the larger social impacts of a decision to, um, to, su to support uh, the expansion of a charter school in our community. We can't stop the state of North Carolina from granting as many charters as they want. Um, and we have very recently seen that they have you know, chosen to expand the original number of charters from 100 to um, something in the 170s rather than, rather than uh, acting as labs for, for innovation and for exploration. Um, I believe that charters are now becoming a mechanism by which public education in our state and in our community is being um, is being threatened and is being harmed, um, and we, you know, we can't stop the state from, for example, setting up an innovative school district that would turn over control of our local schools to a charter board that is run by people who have poured their personal fortunes into expanding charters around the country, as well as. Pay, you know, donating to the politicians who vote to expand the charter schools. Right there, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of political and social implications of this choice, and I think that we have an opportunity tonight to actually do something. Like we we cannot stop the state of North Carolina from doing what they want um, with regard to the expansion of charter schools, but we have the we have the discretion not to assist that, not to contribute um, our city's uh, stamp to that endeavor. Um, and given the fact that, you know, every student who goes to a charter is taking resources away from a public system that the majority of our students rely on, that the majority of low income and black and brown students rely on and continue to rely on, um, I feel uncomfortable making a decision that I feel directly impacts um, the viability and the future of our public system. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question about who owns the property currently? Uh, the school currently owns the property. And, and who owned it prior to that? I'm sorry? Who owned it prior to you, you guys purchasing? Uh, it, it was a... A building originally it was Liggett and Myers National Headquarters and um, the person that owned it was Arnold Litwin Logan who lives in Canada and uh, we purchased the building from him I just I, I mean I'm thank you I, I, I want to say that I, I want to be upfront and saying like my children attend a charter school, and I completely disagree with what was stated prior to in regards to funds being taken by charters. I think we all should understand that the situation that's been created has been created by the way financing happens for our schools. And the issue I take specifically in this instance is that there, this charter school has been, been bound up on the basis of how our system is set up. It's not that the charter's fault that they don't have the funds to purchase a building in order to operate. The, the fact that CFA is feeding off of them does not mean that we should also kick them in the gut and then make sure that they can't operate in the same, I, I mean, I, I find it quite offensive that we would even consider using this as an opportunity to, to pretty much push a charter school out of business for children who are in school, I mean, there's enough going on with our kids in this, in this city around immigration, and then you want to add into it education, that these are not the ways in which you go about adjusting to the systems. You have to take the steps that we need to take to actually address the issues around racism and around systemic and institutional racism so that we actually hit the issue at the root, not, not picking and choosing which folks are going to be hurt by our rules. This is, this is not the opportunity to, to do anything of the sort. It is actually harmful, more harmful, to put them at risk of taking more money from a CFA or any other organization that would try and come into this state and put them at risk of, of, of their board being, I mean, this is frustrating because I, I, I understand the philosophical arguments and debates as well. 
around how in which the North Carolina State Assembly has assigned funds to schools. We would not be sitting here having this conversation if they were the North Carolina School of Math and Science, which is also a charter. No, it's not. It is a state charter. It is a publicly funded yes, Catherine. It is operating in the same manner. Those funds are also allocated in the same manner, and we cannot we cannot sit here and say that just because it's Excelsior that we're going to do this to one and not the other. We have to come up with a way that addresses the system and institution, not the individuals. In this case, you would be harming the students that attend that school, the parents that have decided for their, their children to attend those schools. Approving this funding, we don't, we don't pay any funding. We're not, we're not responsible for any of their funding. The school is. This is not, this is not a, this is not the football that we want to throw. Like, this is not the case. I would go to the mat on defending public schools. This is not how you do it. Thank you. Council Member Caballero, did you have a comment? I just, just sharing that the School of Math and Science is not a charter school. That's all. Okay. Um, other comments? Mr. Mayor, just one. There are... Durham students attending this school right now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council members? Council Member Reese? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank the folks from Excelsior for being here tonight. I want to thank my colleagues for a very spirited conversation about some very complicated issues. I think what they, what the conversation tonight reveals to me is that the rules have been established to force communities to have these types of very difficult conversations. Um, I am the parent of two children in our public schools. Um, I don't want to cast a vote that will harm their schools, their school or any other school in our public system. And to the extent that this vote that we're gonna take right now um, authorizes uh, the issuance of bonds that fund the purchase and expansion of this, what sounds to be like a fantastic charter school that does so many of the things we wish all charter schools would do in this state, um, and that was partially founded and established by my friend and colleague at the other side of the dais. Um, it's going to expand your school. More children, more Durham children are going to go to your school, and more of our tax dollars are going to go to your school because more kids will be going there. That's the crux of the problem we're having is that, that the vote that we cast tonight could easily cause uh, fewer dollars to go to our public school system. I, I can't do that. I understand your, your school, like I said, I wish every charter school in the, in the state would do the things you do for your kids. I had the same kind of eye on diversity of population, of student population, of, of, uh, of staff, um, uh, you know, the, the meals and the transportation, you know, from my perspective, I won't cast a vote that would do that. And uh, I'm somewhat comforted by the fact that uh, there are lots of other governmental entities that can provide this authorization for you. Um, I just don't believe this body should be one of them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, if I might. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I thank my colleague um, for the acknowledgement. Um, I do just want to push back a little bit on the use of the word causality. Um, I don't believe voting for this resolution will cause the school to expand. The charter that was issued by the state is the causal factor that will have. They're going to expand anyway. So I, I, while it might um, aid them, um, and, I, and I, I, um, I think the point that more money would go to brick and mortar as opposed to our kids who are going there right now, this school is already functioning. Um, but I, I would take issue with the, the, the use of the phrase causality, um, suggesting that they will not expand if we don't do it. Um, they've already been issued a charter which will allow them to go to K through 12. Um, this is not costing us any money. Um, this is um, being used as a foil uh, in a conversation that we need to have. And again, I'm, I'm just surprised how much time we've spent on education in the chamber by a body that has almost uh, um, in a mantra type way. We have nothing to do with education. It's not our business. And now we're, we're doing a deep dive 
it's clear um, that, and I would venture to say, probably everybody up here agrees, um, uh, would come down on the same side of the debate with charter schools. I do not think it is appropriate to use this particular issue uh, to, to, to make points or to stake out philosophical claims. Um, I just don't think, and many of the claims I agree with. I just don't think this is appropriate. And, uh, and I would just, again, reiterate, this is not causality here uh, tonight. They're going to expand anyway. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other council members? Yeah. Mr. Yes. Mayor, could I just make a couple points? Yes, please. Um, this charter school does pull from 10 counties. So it is bringing um, dollars per pupil dollars from nine other counties into Durham County, just to make sure that that point is made. And the other point is just to remember that the charter schools operate, with, they use the same per pupil dollars from the state and from the county to provide all the things that you heard and to pay either rent or debt service without any capital dollars. So um, they don't get any capital dollars from either the state or the county, they are using those per pupil dollars have to also cover the putting the kids in a building. So in some ways it's fewer dollars because there are no capital dollars coming for these children. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Other comments or questions? Would you like to add anything, ma'am? Any other thoughts? I did want to point out one thing. Uh, you spoke in support of public schools. We are a public school subject to all the rules. Um, we have extensive oversight from the state. Um, and the money that follows the students to our school belongs with the students, not to the district schools. Um, and we are educating those students and we are doing a good job in doing that. Thank you. Council members, any more comments or questions? Mm -hmm. All right, well, let me just say a few things. I am also struggling with this, and I appreciate my colleagues and their comments on this. It's been very useful, and, and um, uh, I... Um, I really feel like nothing is more important in our community than the success of Durham Public Schools. And at the same time, I definitely recognize that there are parents who, uh, for many different reasons, have chosen charters, uh, and that the policy which I think has been damaging, uh, I, I believe all our kids ought to be going to school together. Uh, the fact that our state has made a policy that is damaging to that very important goal um, has put us in the situation that we're in. And I, I don't fault parents for making that decision to send their kids to charters, but I do think that there are, here what we have is a public policy issue. And I think uh, the reason that we're talking about it is it's come to us. Um, it's not that we've sought it out, it's come to us because of the reasons that the bond council described, it's our and and the staff, um, and so we're forced to deal with it. And as we're forced to deal with it, we're forced to think about our own educational philosophies and what we believe about this particular public policy. Um, my own feelings about uh, charters and our Durham public school system is that individual charters such as yours, uh, which have a lot of diversity, and, I'm, sh and I'm, I'm sure you're doing a really good job educating your students, are, um, you know, I congratulate you, and I know that you and your, your teachers are doing the very best they can to educate the students that you have. On the other hand, I do think that we are faced in this state with a situation where that, where charters are, uh, 
making it so that it's much harder for our Durham Public Schools and our public schools in general to operate successfully. Um, it is taking parents and families out of Durham Public Schools who have choices, and we need those parents in our school system. So I think that's my feeling on the public policy issue. Then the question becomes, and I appreciate Mark Anthony's, uh, Councilmember Middleton's uh, comments on this, is, is this the appropriate place to take that issue up? Uh, is, it, is, this a, is this an appropriate way to address the issue of charters and public schools? And I've really thought about that a lot over the last few days and appreciated these comments today. Um, and what I would say is that what we are doing here is we are offering, what, what we have to offer is a financing tool. Uh, we are offering this financing tool, or would be offering this financing tools, tool to um, uh, a charter school, and I think that is an important public policy consideration. Do we want to offer that financing tool? Uh, and in my mind, uh, I, I don't think that we do, um, especially given the fact that there are other options for the school. It may be that the options are a taxable loan. I understand that that's more expensive. It may be, and I expect that there are other uh, non-taxable options as well. Uh, but for me, this is a very close call. Uh, but I do think that in this case, uh, it does pass the test, in my mind, of uh, a, uh, as, as, as as an actual public policy issue for us and not just something kind of technical. Uh, and so I feel like I can vote on that basis and I will vote on that basis. Other comments? I, I would just like to add that the public policy around providing a financing tool for a nonprofit on the basis of what's been laid out seems like a very good reason to support this charter. So if you're stating that, you know, Durham Public Schools is more important than the children who attend those, those schools, I understand your vote in saying that you wouldn't support. But if you're not saying that, I don't understand. And I'm trying to reconcile being amongst council members that would put those needs of the children behind the public policy as opposed to addressing the issue, which would be the way that the financing occurs. If you have a tool that makes it available for this school to address their building and operating, rather than using the funds to support the students and their learning, I'm, I'm struggling with why you would put them in position to not do that. I'll just say for myself that what I try to think about is what's best for the most students in the most schools over time? That's, that's kind of my test. Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, immense, immense respect for you and your, and your, um, and your comments. Um, the, the public policy issue for me is serving our children who are already in school. I, I because I can't, it's not within my purview or power to vote to give $20 million to our traditional public schools, because I can't do that, I'm not going to not allow um, a, a charter school to um, pursue uh, money, because my hands are tied on the other hand. Um, you know, I, I personally uh, watched um, particularly young black boys, the way their faces lit up, um, when they walked in the hallways of that school. And I've personally uh, listened to, to countless testimonies uh, of parents uh, who were so elated uh, that their children uh, were in this environment. Um, so I agree, it, this is a public policy issue, but the public policy issue for me uh, are uh, the students, the children uh, that are there now. Now, you know, they may get the 20 million and they may not pay it back. They, they, I'm free, I'm, I'm okay with giving them the opportunity to fail. Uh, I am not okay 
was using this as a foil for my larger political or philosophical views. And uh, the adults that work in that building are going to be okay. They're, they're going to be fine. They got degrees. They can find other jobs. My, my focus are the children that are being served by that school right now. And if I have an opportunity to put a school and, and a public school, charter public school, in a position uh, to spend more money on kids than more money on uh, brick and mortar while keeping faith with the residents and citizens of Durham, not committing one penny of our treasures, of our coffers to this effort, and can put some people that are Durhamites, that love this city, that love our children, in a position to help kids, then I'm going to do that, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. And those are exactly the reasons that I think this is a very close call. I appreciate that. Any other questions? Any other comments? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is back before the council. Thank you all very much. Is there here a motion that we uh, approve the uh, resolution approving the issuance by the Public Financing Authority? That would be the uh, approving the issuance by the Public Finance Authority of its Education Revenue Bond Series 2018 in an amount not to exceed $20 million. I'll move. So moved. Is second. there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve this uh, resolution. And I'm going to ask Madam Clerk, well, first of all, is there any more discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion, motion fails by a vote of five to two with Council Member Middleton and Council Member Freeman voting in the affirmative. Thank you very much. I will now move to item 24. And I want to thank my colleagues for their discussion on that last item. I think that's probably the longest uh, debate we've had in our months together on Council, and I appreciate both the passion and the ideas that were brought to me. We're now going to move to item 24, zoning map change 5123 Chin Page Road. And I'm going to ask for a report from staff. Thank you. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. A request for zoning map change has been received from Charlie Yokely for one parcel totaling approximately one acre located at 5123 Chin Page Road. The subject site is presently designated as industrial on the future land use map, but is currently zoned residential rural. Mr. Yokely is proposing to change this zoning designation to industrial light, which would align with the current future land use map. A new development plan was submitted in conjunction with this request, so if approved, any uses allowed in the IL district would be permissible. A list of those uses can be found in attachment eight in your packet. At the May 8th, 2018 hearing, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this item by a vote of 11 to zero, and staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and adopted policies and ordinances. Two motions would be required for this item, one on the consistency statement and the second on the zoning ordinance. And I'll be happy to answer any questions the council may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiggins. You all have heard the report from staff. I'm gonna declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm gonna ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. Any questions? We do have one person who has signed up to speak, Mr. Charlie Yokely. Mr. Yokely, uh, would you please come to the podium, sir? Is there anyone else who would like to speak on item 24? Anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Mr. Yokely, welcome. You have three minutes. Yes, sir. I'll keep it brief. Um, just to, to back up what Jacob said. It, the, Can you give your name and address? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Charlie Yokely, 2905 Meridian Parkway, Durham 27113. I uh, just want to reiterate what Mr. Wiggins said. Uh, this request is uh, in compliance with the comprehensive land use plan. Um, really, the goal here, the surrounding properties are zoned IL industrial light, and in the same ownership, the goal here is just to bring this small track into uh, matching zoning with the surrounding properties. There's no intended user at this time. It's just a, really just a paperwork thing, and I'll gladly answer any questions you guys have. Thank you, Mr. Yokely. Sure. Are there any questions or comments from Mr. Yokely? Spe I, specifically, I, I'm just recognizing that 
There are hardwoods in this, hardwood trees in this area. Are there any plans to preserve them? Are there any plans to what? Preserve the trees that are lining this area. When, the, in the event that this property is developed, it'll be in compliance with the Durham UDO, which requires 20% tree save. Um, so what is required to be saved will be saved. Uh, and, and nothing more? Well, I, I can't, we can't, I really can't speak to what <laughs> additionally may be done because at this time we don't have an end user or an intended use of this property. We have no development plans drawn up or anything like that. So, so then what would prompt you to make this request? I'm, so, I'm, I'm a little confused. But the property owner owns a larger piece it's to the north and east of this small one acre tract and they just want to bring it did this small piece is zone rr and their so their surrounding property is zone il so the point is just to have both of their properties in the same zoning district and what what is the like the pro of that of having both of them in the same zoning district in the future to save somebody the step of having to rezone this one small piece of land without having to go through having a planning or development plan at hand. Right, okay. right. Okay, thank you. Any more questions or comments? If but not. I'm, I just have a question for staff. Is this, I'm noticing this is becoming more of a norm of where we're getting these future plans for, you know, a development, but they're just being rezoned now. Is there anything in, in our ordinance that, that could actually um, help me to understand exactly where this is happening and how it's happening because I'm, I'm concerned that there might be a, a larger plan in play where we're rezoning and then you know having the change occur and then coming back so you don't have to come back at all to, de to declare what your development is. Mm -hmm. um, there's not anything in the ordinance that would currently prohibit this type of rezoning request. And is there anything in our comprehensive plan um, analysis that is occurring right now? Because, I mean, I, th I feel like it would fall into place under the equitable development conversation and recognizing that there are multiple, like, cases that have come before us that are not sharing a development plan beforehand. Yeah, um, I mean, there is, for with every rezoning case, we certainly reference the comprehensive plan. If you reference attachment five in your packet, you'll see a comprehensive plan consistency analysis. With this request and staff did determine that the request met the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. And just recognizing like there's no, because there's no plan, like there's no development plan in place, I don't know what the, what the impact will be to our city. I got gotcha. you. So that would be covered by the existing regulations in the Unified Development Ordinance, which this body has previously adopted. Okay. So if it's rezoned, they will still have to meet the requirements in the ordinance itself. It's just there's not a development plan associated with this particular parcel at this time. But switching from RR to IL, mm -hmm. those change? Yes, oh, certainly. Yeah, so they'll have you know hiring buffering standards and things like that to protect adjacent uses. With the IL, is it higher for the buffering status than the RR? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other questions or comments? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Do I hear a motion to adopt a consistency statement as acquired by NCGS 160A-383? Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved and uh, seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The consistency statement passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Is the board not working, Madam Clerk? Is the voting board not working so that people can see? Thank you. Uh, and then the second motion to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance by taking property out of the residential rural zoning district and establishing the same as industrial life for the subject site. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much.
All right, we will now move to item 25, Boone Street closing, and we will now hear from staff. Sure, and Mayor, before we proceed, I'd like to note that all planning items tonight have been noticed in accordance with applicable local and state laws and affidavits are on file with the planning department noting such. Thank you. I know when Jacob's over there, you have to like really bring that microphone down, don't you? Or just improvise. Or just <laughs> improvise, that's right. <laughs> Ms. Sonyak. Good evening. I'm Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Mark and Madison Maravelli request to permanently close a 296 linear foot portion of Boone Street between Laddister Street and Dixon Street. The right of way is currently dedicated but has never been built. If the request is approved, the closed right of way acreage will be added to the adjacent parcels as shown on the plat. The request meets applicable ordinances ordinance requirements and no issues were raised during the reviews. Staff recommends the permanent closure of this 296 linear foot portion of Boone Street. Thank you very much. You have heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open and first I'm going to ask if there are any questions by members of the council for our staff. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, so I noticed that there's a concrete driveway that was built in this right of way, which is part of the reason um, for the request for the closure. I'm just wondering the circumstances behind that. Uh, I cannot speak to those circumstances. I'm not sure if the property owner um, or the applicant is here and can. Yes, so, sir. Yeah, would you yeah, like to come to the podium? Thank you. And introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Mark Marvelli. I live at 3217 Lassiter Street, which is one of the lots adjoining uh, the portion to be closed or requested to be closed. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Council Member, I, I cannot tell you how that driveway got there. I purchased the property last year. Um, at the time that I uh, looked at the property, uh, the driveway was already there. And uh, to anyone traveling down the street on Lassiter or on the opposite side on Dixon, it just looks like this uh, paper street essentially is part of the existing properties. So you found out when you bought the house that your driveway was actually not entirely on your property? Yes, that's correct. Okay, um, okay thank you. Yeah, I just kind of wondered how that came to be. <laughs> it is an interesting question. We'll be left with the mystery. Thank you. Follow up on yes, uh, <laughs> any other questions or comments? Just the follow up, Mr. Mayor. Yes, please. So in this instance, in, or I'm sorry, this question's for staff. In this instance, who would we go back to on, I guess, approval of this cement driveway? Good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, Council Member Freeman, the, when this occurs, when you see an encroachment like this in a, a right of way, there was no approval granted. So we do have a zoning enforcement program, but in a public right of way, unless you catch somebody in the act of installing uh, an improvement like this, it's very difficult to pursue enforcement because it's not, it's on public property. So there's really uh, no one to enforce against. So this is something we are continually in the lookout for, but there's no approval granted for this driveway that's been referred to. So is it in planning that the, that the enforcement would happen? And do you have staff on that? Is there a specific person who does enforcement on that? We do. We do have an enforcement staff that looks at these items, but, but as I alluded to, when it's an improvement in a public like right. right of way unless someone tries to claim ownership or, or use of the of the improvement what, such as the case here this is really the only remedy uh, to, to make the uh, encroachment uh, legal or the city could assert its rights to uh, accept the right of way and then remove the encroachment those are the only options really I'm trying to think of how you implement a way so that in the future the owner doesn't have to be the one that lets you know, the new owner doesn't have to be the one that lets you know that there's an encroachment. And I would love to hear more about that at another time. Sure, thank you. We, we do have a patrol program. We have identified these in the past, but 
the, what's before you tonight is really the available remedy. And I just want to be, I'm sorry, I just want to also be, note that this is also the case with uh, drainage and other encroachments in public right away that I'm concerned about. So it's not just specific to concrete, it's, it's also under the ground as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Would anyone else like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? If not, I'm going to declare the public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, there's a motion. Uh, does anyone like to move to adopt an order permanently closing a 296 linear foot portion of Boone Street? I make that motion. It's been moved and seconded that we uh, to adopt this order closing Boone Street. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-1 with Councilmember Freeman voting no. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will now move to item 26, K Street closing. Um, and uh, we'll now hear from staff. Thank you. Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. Uh, Mr. Ronald Carpenter has submitted a request to permanently close a 766.81 linear foot portion of K Street. This portion of K Street is currently open and maintained by the city. Duke University owns all of the surrounding parcels. If closed, the right-of-way will be recombined with the adjacent properties as shown on the attached street closing plat. This request meets applicable ordinance requirements and no issues were raised by review agencies during the review of this item. Staff recommends the permanent closure of this 766.81 linear foot portion of K Street. And I'll be happy to answer any questions the council may have. Thank you very much. You've heard the report from staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, and uh, I will first ask if there are any questions for staff or comments by members of the council. Specifically, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Specifically, for, and similar to the previous case, this mm -hmm. is an underground issue, um, or underground, recognizing that there's an easement for the sanitary sewers. Mm -hmm. Once you close off that right away, how does access look like well, by it's the just a manhole? So there's an easement. There's going to be an easement <laughs> along the entire length of that sewer line. So even if the street is closed, the city, by maintaining that easement, has access and rights to access that area and operate on that sewer line if need be. And you can ensure that they can't build on top of it? I can. With the same type of enforcement? That we were just talking the, about? Yeah, the only way they could build in that area is if they were to move um, move the sewer line or dedicate a new sewer line and remove this one. Other questions? I have a comment that I'm going to make in a moment, but first, are there, is there anyone here who would like to speak on item 26, K Street closing? Is there anyone here today who would like to speak on item 26? Um, let me just ask you, Mr. Wiggins, we corresponded today. Yes, sir. Um, th this field has been, how long ago did the university purchase the field approximately? Do you know? I, am, I apologize. I do not know. I know. I should, I should have asked that when I emailed you today, but I would say it's, I believe it was. I believe, Patrick, you were still city manager. Is that right, when it was purchased? I believe so. So at least eight years ago then. Ten. Ten. Ten, ten years ago then. Um, the staff report says that this is a vacant athletic field. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not in any way a comment on staff or staff work, but I just need to say how disappointed I am. I know no one's here from the university tonight, but I, I will be sending this message. How disappointed I am that Duke University has had this field for 10 years, and it is, it was when it, when it was sold to the university, it was in use as an athletic field, as a soccer field. I have coached on that field 50 times. And it is a center city field where it's a large center city field that the university purchased from us. 
Uh, they, they tried to purchase it twice. The first time we didn't sell it to them. This, I, I wasn't on council at that time, but I was a soccer coach, and I came down to advocate against its sale. It was subsequently a, a larger offer was made several years later, and it was sold to the university, and I know that they have plans to potentially develop there. But in the meantime, that field has sat there for a decade, and now it is not being used when we have a tremendous need for fields, especially in the city. And I just, I'm gonna be sending my comments to the university about that, but I just wanna say how, how wrong I think that is. On the other hand, I'm happy for them to close the street. <laughs> uh, so, um, any more comments? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter's back before the council. Ma'am, I would like to make a motion, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I'd like to uh, move that we adopt an order permanently closing 766.81 linear feet of Case Street here in the city of Durham. Second. Second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. <laughs> Motion passes 6-0 with Councilmember Freeman voting no. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to item 27, zoning map change, Rollingdale. Um, and we will hear the report from staff. Good evening, Jamie Sanyak with the Planning Department. A request for zoning map change has been received from Landon Lovelace, underfoot engineering for two parcels, totaling approximately 6.65 acres located at 602 and 606 West NC 54. This matter was introduced at the June 18th, 2018 City Council. <clears throat> the subject site is presently zoned um, residential suburban 20. The applicant is requesting a zoning designation of planned development residential 3.94, which is consistent with the low density residential four dwelling units um, per acre or less designation on the future land use map of the city's comprehensive plan. Key commitments on the development plan associated with this request include a maximum of 25 townhouse units. No townhouse units um, buildings shall be located closer than 30 feet to another townhouse building. The on-site retaining walls will be tan, brown, earth toned, and will be no greater than 10 feet tall. <clears throat> Design commitments for garages include use of staggered facades and varied garage door styles. Exposed foundations of more than 48 inches will be covered with siding or stone brick veneer. Three additional proffers were added subsequent to the June 18th, 2018 City Council date. An, addition, uh, an additional 10 feet of tree conservation areas along the southern boundary uh, totaling 40 feet, an increase in the minimum setback from the southern property line from 60 to 70 feet, <coughs> and wherever silt fencing is proposed as a perimeter sedimentation control measure, a double row shall be added instead of a single row. The Durham Planning Commission at their April 10th, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of nine to five. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Um, two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement, and the second is for the zoning ordinance. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Sonyak. Uh, before uh, uh, I the, resume the public hearing, uh, we had asked the City Attorney to have a discussion with the County Attorney, and if you could please report to us on that, uh, Mr. Attorney. Certainly, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I did want to let Council know that I have had conversations pursuant to the direction that we had uh, when this meeting was first, uh, this public hearing was first opened, uh, as it related to a Durham Planning Commissioner who had voted on the item and was appearing uh, before you as an attorney for the applicant. Um, I have been informed by the county attorney that that particular, uh, that they have investigated that and they found no violation of uh, their county ethics policy in that matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Attorney. Uh, council members, I, I'm going to remind you all that we uh, are re now resuming a public hearing uh, that we had um, opened before the recess. Uh, and uh, so I will now declare this public hearing resumed.
uh, and first ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. For the city attorney, actually. Uh -huh. So I'm, based on what you're saying, I'm, I'm understanding that there is a policy and that there is a county ethics policy, and uh, the it's the manager, the county manager, that that determines whether there is a violation of the policy, and they found no violation of the county ethics policy in this matter. Okay. Thank you. Are there questions for staff? Any questions for staff at this point? Okay. Yes, council member. Um, just real quickly, also with the BPAC attachment, does the comments that those still stand as well, correct? Accommodations there? I was not here for June 18th. Well, feel free. All questions welcome. So, uh, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department, and I am referring to attachment number nine. Um, these, these comments uh, do still stand. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for this staff at this, at this point? Uh, if not, uh, we have several speakers on this item. Uh, we have six people who are signed up as opponents and one person signed up as proponents. The proponent, Patrick Biker. And uh, the opponents, I'm going to read your names, and then uh, w I'll let you know uh, our plan here. Maria Girlando, Larry Parrish, Ashley Atkins, Jeff Brandenburg, Erica Legum, and Keith Boudreau uh, are all signed up as opponents. Let me ask, is there anyone else who would like to sign up to speak on this item? Is there anyone else who would like to sign up to speak on this item? Okay. Let me just count these. I think there's six. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, give each side, the proponents and the opponents, 15 minutes. Uh, and we will start with the proponents. Mr. Biker. Mr. Mayor, could I interrupt briefly on a procedural matter? Of course. Or, I apologize, Mr. Biker. Um, so as I understand it, did we leave the public hearing open last time? Yes, we did. And by your remarks tonight, I, do I take you to be granting folks who may have spoken at the previous public hearing additional time tonight? To I speak? did. Yes. Great. I just want to make that clear. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Yes, this will be in addition to previous uh, previous time. Let me just say that before we get started here on this, I just want you to know that one of the people who was here. Um, who remains here tonight, uh, who was one of the people who I spoke to, uh, is a, this young woman right here who is a, is a planner, urban planner from the city of Nazareth. Let me just say that the zone, planning and zoning issues that they have in the city of Nazareth <laughs> are just a little more fraught in the city of Durham. Are there historic <laughs> preservation issues to be considered? <laughs> I think there might be, uh, Mr. Biker. Uh, but uh, she wanted to remain afterwards to uh, see how we do it here in Durham. Uh, and uh, we're, we're glad that both of you all were able to stay and, uh, and be here with us tonight. Once upon a time, there was a lot of uh, very high-quality stick-built construction in the city of Nazareth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once upon a time. Once upon a time. Okay, uh, Mr. Biker, uh, the proponents have 15 minutes. Good evening, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I'm with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm here tonight representing Envision Homes. Since the last time this case was before you, uh, we've had the opportunity to revise the development plan, and I want to touch briefly on the changes we've made. First, along the southern edge of the site, we have increased the width of the tree save area an additional 10 feet, from 30 feet to 40 feet. In order to keep the same spacing off of the tree save area, we also increased the restriction on building placement near the southern property line, and that's been increased from 60 feet to 70 feet. Finally, we've added a commitment to double the amount of silt fencing required at the time of construction to better control erosion. Now, looking at the big picture for Durham, my belief is that the people here tonight who oppose this rezoning generally live in houses built in the 1980s. 
I reference that time period because it is the time frame referred to in the Housing Development Toolkit released by President Obama's administration in 2016 when he put the spotlight on the issue of how cities can support new, inclusive housing. From the excerpts in this document, I quote, over the past three decades, local barriers to housing development have intensified, particularly in the high growth metropolitan areas increasingly, increasingly fueling the national economy. Researchers examining proxy measures have found that barriers to housing development increased rapidly from 1970 to 1990 and continue to increase through the present day. For decades, Sunbelt cities with more permeable boundaries have enjoyed outsized growth by allowing sprawl to meet their need for housing supply. Space-constrained cities can achieve similar gains, however, by building up through infill. Most development today goes through a discretionary review process prior to approval, such as public hearings or local legislative actions. These processes predispose development decisions to become centers of controversy and can add significant costs to the overall development budget due to the delay and uncertainty they engender. The trade-offs that developers make to account for these additional costs can result in lost affordability, quality, or quantity of units developed. When new housing development is limited region-wide and particularly precluded in neighborhoods with political capital to implement even stricter local barriers, any new development tends to be disproportionately concentrated in low-income communities of color causing displacement and concern of concerns with gentrification in those neighborhoods, raising market rents within neighborhoods experiencing rapid changes while failing to reduce housing cost growth region-wide. While the housing market recovery has meant growing home values for existing homeowners, barriers to development concentrate those gains among existing homeowners, pushing the cost of ownership out of reach for too many first-time buyers and the availability of quality, affordable housing is foundational for every family. It determines which jobs they can access, which schools their children can attend, and how much time they can spend together at the end of a day's commutes." Unquote. I referred to this document almost two years ago during a zoning map change we worked on in North Durham, where I found there are some homes that have lost value according to our tax office. I do not think there have been comparable losses in residential values in South Durham. And so the issues raised in this report from President Obama's administration are even more important relative to this case. Envision Homes recognizes the need for both subsidized affordable housing and market rate affordable housing to serve the missing middle. On a project of this size, they are hoping to achieve market rate affordability, which is a vital concern addressed in this report. In addition, Envision is committed to addressing this affordable affordability issue for our city. Having reviewed the affordable housing commitments the City Council has approved on other projects, the average commitment is around $500 per unit. Envision will double that amount as we are proffering to make a payment to the Affordable Housing Fund equal to $1,000 per unit or $25,000. Accordingly, for all these reasons, we respectfully ask for your approval tonight. We reserve the rest of our time for rebuttal and to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Biker. And you have reserved your time. Yes, sir. Uh, I will now ask, I'm going to call the names of the people who have signed up to speak in opposition. And if you all could make your way here to the right. Uh, and uh, you will have collectively 15 minutes. And so that's something less. You can do the math. Uh, since there are six of you, a little less than three minutes per. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll call your names. And if you could come up in the order in which I call them. Uh, Ashley Adkins. Larry Parrish, Maria Girlando, Keith Boudreau, and Erica Legum. Ms. Atkins, welcome. Thank you. Please state your name and address. All right. My name is Ashley Atkins. I live at 15 St. James Court in Woodcroft. And um, I just wanted to start out with the fact that on the developer's website, these homes are listed as $450,000 each. So in my opinion, that is not the style home that is going to fit in with the surrounding Woodcroft area. 
Um, you know, I, I also have the reason um, that I don't want to look out my backyard and look at a wall or a block of townhomes. Um, I don't know what the other options are, but to me, that's one of the, the worst options. Um, I'd also like to point out there is an online petition, and uh, it's called no to the rezone.com. It has almost 300,000, I mean, 300 signatures, and I wish it had 300,000. Mm -hmm. That, and, that uh, would have been extremely persuasive. <laughs> yes, it would have been. <laughs> And uh, most of the signatures come from Durham residents. Um, the developers did not approach uh, the neighbors as a whole. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think 10 feet is really going to make a difference, especially when I just saw how much runoff comes onto my property when a rainstorm comes along. Um, I'm not sure if you all saw the, the photos of the runoff that occurred. Um, so I'd really appreciate you all um, not approving this development and helping out Woodcroft. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. If, if we could now hear from Mr. Larry Parrish. Mr. Parrish. Uh, good evening. My name is Larry Parrish, and my family is at 6 Abaddon Way which is my understanding is the closest, my house will be the closest to the new um, buildings that will be built. Uh, my concern is that we have a son that's um, wheelchair bound, nonverbal, that was hit on Highway 54, walking home from work, that put him in this condition almost six years ago, it'll be six years, August the 15th. Um, we and try to, um, give him a better quality of life. We converted our deck into a sunroom with a lot of light. And if you look at the back of our house, you see green trees, a lot of nature. I know Mr. Reese has been at home and has, has witnessed that. It gives Andy a great deal of satisfaction to go out every day in that house, uh, in that room. We call it the rehab room because a lot of the rehab takes place there. And each day we position him at a different place so that he can have a different view. And it's really the highlight of his uh, day, every day. If you ask him where you want him to go, although he cannot speak, he will direct you to which room in the house he wants to go. And as opposed to going to the room that we have a huge television that he can watch television, he would prefer to go to the rehab room. Now, our concern is that when you come in and build those new condos or whatever, you're going to cut down a tremendous amount of the trees. And so, just as Ashley said, Andy's going to be looking at the back of a lot of condos. And that's our main concern, that whatever can be done to uh, eliminate him having to look, whatever barrier can be established, that would be greatly appreciated. I know that, as we mentioned, some uh, alterations have already been considered. The second concern that I have is the traffic on Highway 54. My son was hit on 54 by a car with a driver that had no license. We won't go any farther with that. But I don't care how many homes you put there, it's going to add traffic to Highway 54. Recently, at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning, we had to take Andy to the hospital to get out on Highway 54 from Highgate, the entrance into Woodcroft. We had to wait for four cars to get by so that we could get on Highway 54 to go to Duke University Hospital. So that, those are my two concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. Mr. Parrish, I just want to say that you're a loving parent. Thank you. And uh, it's very moving to hear you talk about your son and your family. So thank you. Thank you. We have the best guy on the university, I mean on the planet Earth. He's the best. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jeff Brandenburg. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Brandenburg. We'll, we'll do it in this order. Thanks. My name is Jeff Brandenburg. I live at 2 Abingdon Way. 
Uh, there are three points that I'd like to cover. First, um, I thank the council and the county authorities for discussing the issue of conflict of interest that appeared in the previous hearing. I understand and accept the finding that there was no violation of the county ethics policy. At the same time, it's going to be very difficult to accept that the decision of the planning board was entirely untainted by events that unfolded afterward. This, at the meeting where the planning board made this decision, there was a spirited defense given of this development, and the fact that that spirited defense was followed in fairly short order by hiring as a legal representative is just really very hard to accept. Again, I understand, though, that there's been a finding that there is no conflict there. The second point that I wanted to raise is about traffic. I understand that the Department of Transportation has said that the incremental amount of traffic from this development will be very small compared to the traffic that's already present on 54. However, it does not seem like that simple analysis in terms of percentage increase considers the specific circumstances of this stretch of 54. It is curved and hilly, the prevailing speeds are high, and we have frequent accidents there where people are stopped to turn and people come up behind them, or where people try to turn and someone else is coming the other way. With more traffic coming into this development, with a bus stop stopping on 54 at a place where there is a hill not too much further back, we are concerned that there will be a significantly increased risk of serious traffic accidents there. The third point that I wanted to make involves stormwater runoff. We've talked about this at some length. Um, again, we understand that specific commitments for how catch ponds and so forth are going to be arranged won't be produced until it's time for another phase of the development planning. But at the same time, while this property is zoned for approximately four units per acre one way or another, that doesn't automatically make it possible for every acre to support four units. These units are going to have to be arranged in such a way to provide room for a catch pond, and zoning rules do not really overrule the laws of physics or of hydrology. You can't have a sloped catch pond. We are very concerned about how you're going to build a catch pond that will hold this amount of runoff with safe retaining walls on the very steep slope where the pond will have to reside. We would like very much to see a clearer picture of how that's going to work because we're nervous about the idea of a very tall pond with a very tall wall right across from houses. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Brandenburg. And now we'll hear from Maria Ghirlando. Thank you. Um, I had a quick question for the city attorney, is that all right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, was the state bar asked if this was considered a conflict of interest, noting that the law firm told us before the case came to the planning commission that they could not represent the neighborhood because they had a conflict? Were they told the details? <laughs> so I, I don't know exactly what was told. Um, as it turns out, this was a county issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was the county attorney's office and the county manager uh, that actually investigated uh, the matter. I was not actually involved in the investigation. The communications that we may have forwarded to you relating to us contacting the law firm before the case came to the City Planning Commission were not maybe shared? I don't recall getting a communication, um, but um, but I, I did not share anything other than uh, the information that I had gleaned from the, uh, the beginning of the meeting back in um, uh, May. And the state part was not asked? Was I'm their not opinion aware. on the matter? I'm not aware that they were. Okay. I, I, we just feel very strongly that there's a clear conflict of interest, and just because it's not illegal doesn't mean it's not unethical. Um, I'll be quick, because I want to make sure they have enough um, time. 
So we know Durham needs housing. We appreciate that you all have that responsibility on your shoulders along with protecting us. Um, we're a growing city. We're a beautiful city because of the large amount of tree canopy, the trees and nature that have been protected so far. We commend you for that. Um, my family, who's from Miami, visit me yearly for the last 16 years. And my nephews this year, all three of them, 14, 13, and 20, um, have made a commitment that they want to move to South Durham from Miami. They want to move to South Durham. These are very modern boys. They love the nature, the peace from the, everything that Durham is. It's not just Woodcroft, it's the city as a whole. And we feel that by allowing developers who are being, um, I don't know how to phrase this nicely, so forgive me, a bit gritty in trying to make as much profit as possible, because we do know it's more expensive to build if you don't raise all the trees. Um, we are doing ourselves a disfavor. We'll have short-term housing, but we're going to lose all that mobility of people that want to come live here because we grew to love the city. I've only been here 16 years. I don't want to ever leave. I love Durham. I lived in Capitol Hill. is isn't quite physical, but I like Durham better. It's got more pizzazz. It's got something. Raleigh was also a little bit too boring. So yes, allow the developers to build. I understand they made a commitment. They bought the land, but <clears throat> hold them accountable. If they want to make a lot of money, go to Raleigh and kill that city. Don't come from Raleigh to Durham and make your money off my day-to-day -day life, off our neighborhood. Mr. Parrish, his day-to-day -day life is going to be, we can't afford to move. We bought our homes 20 years ago when they were $100,000 less. And from the beginning, they've mentioned that their homes will be 400,000 because in the very first meeting in October, they cannot afford to build a home in that lot that they have to sell for less than 400. So I don't know what the promises they're making here, but hold them accountable. Protect our city, please, and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gerlando. And now we'll hear from Erica Legum. Mayor, would it be okay if I spoke before Erica, or does it? Um, I'm sorry, what's your name? I'm Keith Boudreaux, sorry. I'm sorry, I've missed you, I apologize, yes. Let me just say that you all have four minutes, approximately. But yes, of course, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll be sorry, quick, apologies. because I know Erica has a lot to say. Uh, my name is Keith Boudreaux, I live in uh, 19 St. James Court, uh, neighbors the proposed development. Uh, we as a community have been in communication about this development proposal behind our homes for almost a year. Uh, as you know, we've had two planning commission meetings where we voiced our concerns. Uh, in the first planning commission meeting, the developers claimed that they had made proffers with us based on conversations with the residents. Commissioner Hyman asked us to verify that those had occurred. We confirmed that they had not. We had not spoken with the developers about anything in these proffers. In the second meeting, the developers claimed that they had reached out to community representatives and that no one had objections. Again, we had to clear up that misstatement. We had organized that meeting with the developers for two purposes. One, to share our concerns, and two, to gather information. In fact, because we were misrepresented before, we were concerned that it might happen again, so I made sure to email all the planning commission so that the intentions were clear about that meeting. I'd like to address now the, uh, the thing that happened at the most recent uh, meeting. <clears throat> Uh, the commissioners had ver uh, various commissioners had voiced concerns about stormwater, traffic, and safety. And then the commissioner in question that we've brought up, I, I know I'm not supposed to name names, so I'll just I'll try to keep it anonymous. Uh, he, he was exclusively a voice for the developers. He spoke about five times as long as anyone else. He shot down the arguments of two of my fellow community members, and he even told an anecdote from his childhood about growing up in a townhome community enjoying trick-or-treating. This is really pulling here. Uh, I've emailed you all links to the commission meeting videos. I know you're all very busy, but if you had a chance to review them, I'm convinced that you'd be, you'd, you'd understand my perception that it was almost like he was a motivated salesman. He wasn't an uh, impartial com uh, commissioner working for the good of our community. Um, after he made those statements, Commissioner Turk actually says he's been influenced by what he had to say, and he will be in voting in favor of the rezone as a result. So this, uh, this commissioner in question clearly affected the outcome of the Planning Commission's <coughs> decision that you're being advised. Uh, 
uh, that he's now uh, that he's immediately after employed by the developers is just an education for me in the way things happen. Um, this has been a news story at least five times in local news, Herald Sun, Indy Week, Spectrum News. Because it's a su substantial interest to the city of Durham, I believe our neighborhood's concerns were not considered impartially. Uh, we need to be able to trust the developers who make drastic changes in the land behind our homes are trustworthy, uh, that they will do what they say they're going to do, that they have our concerns in mind. And based on our experience, uh, I don't have faith that this is the case. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Boudreau. Ms. Wycombe. I have a USB with pictures on it. Is it okay to plug it in right here? Yes, it is. Is it not? Um, doesn't fit here. If there's someone that could help with that, please. We need to do that ahead of time on purpose. In the meantime, uh, good evening and thank you for your time. Yeah. Just hold on, just please wait. The reason that our community initially questioned this development was because the developers refused to address our concerns about the site, even after a number of planning commissioners <laughs> agreed that this area is at risk for pollution and flooding of the Third Fork Creek watershed. The pollution, the developers stated that they'd reached out to our community and negotiated with us when they had absolutely not. As well, these developers refused to address the concerns expressed by the Durham Planning Commission. Here's a list of items that the Planning Commission wanted addressed. <coughs> Commissioner Hyman advised the addition of a right <coughs> turn lane on Highway 54 to address a more efficient flow of traffic. The developers refused. Commissioner Harris re recommended a right turn off lane and bus pull off lane. The developers refused to consider this. Commissioner Gibbs said that this site needs adequate stormwater control measures and the developers refused to provide details. Commissioner Satterfield expressed concerns with the steep slopes and inevitable runoff. She said she'd like to see a widening of the riparian buffer to 100 feet along this entire northeast to southwest boundary of the property. Again, the developers refused. Commissioner Satterfield also stated that without committing to a bus turnout, a bus stop and shelter will simply exacerbate traffic. The developers would not address. Tom Miller of the Planning Commission advised that a right-hand westbound Highway 54 turn lane at the entrance of the development be added to the plan. The developers refused. Ms. Lagum, your 15 minutes is up. Okay. I'm going to add one minute to your time. I appreciate that. And Thank I'm you. Add, excuse me. And I'm going to add one minute to your time, Mr. Biker, as well. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan was concerned about Vivian. safety on Highway 54. He said we must make infrastructure improvements that improve the safety of the traveling public. A westbound right turn lane will do that. However, the applicant had no desire to commit to a westbound right turn lane. They refused. He added that a bus pullover is essential for safety reasons. The Durham Transportation Representative agreed, and once again, the applicant refused. Commissioner Bryan lives in the area. He knows it. His main concerns are environmental. He states that while Durham has very good stormwater regulations for the finished development, the regulations did not seem adequate for the time period during the clearing, and the silting uh, grade was already addressed at this point. The applicant was not willing to provide any more detail as, as to how the environmental disasters would be prevented for this project. At the Planning Commission meeting, the commissioner points out that this requested renote zone is out of character with its surroundings because it's surrounded by low-density residential, as you can see here. And is there any way to use that USB? No, there's not. No? All right. You have to arrange that ahead of time. So thank you so much, Ms. Legum. Thank Appreciate you. it. Um, Mr. Biker, uh, you have the remainder of your time. Be very, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Mayor and members of council just need to uh, uh, address a few points raised by uh, the speakers you just heard. Um, Ashley Atkins has been a friend of mine for a number of years. Of course, her parents are good friends, but uh, her reference to a 450K, $450,000 selling price, that's in relation to the single family. That's the current zoning on this property. If it were developed as single family houses on large lots, those houses would sell for 450. The townhouse project we wish to build would start in the, in the high twos, the two, 275 range, which again, we believe addresses uh, some component of the missing middle with market rate affordability. So I want to correct that uh, on the record. Uh, in regards to runoff in the screen buffer, I do want to uh, stress that the developer has voluntarily limited the impervious surface to 35% on this site, which is half of what the UDO would allow. The UDO allows up to 70%. So I believe we are being good stewards of the environment. Uh, in regards to Mr. Parrish, again, we have considered his situation with his son very carefully. And we've increased the building setback from his property 
to at least 70%. It means it would be probably closer to 80 feet. If you look at the neighbors on his sides, one on one side it's 35 feet, the other side is 55 feet. So the neighbor, are, being the neighbor in the rear, we're, all, we're almost twice as far away as his neighbors on the sides. Uh, in regards to traffic, that's addressed thoroughly in your staff report. If NCDOT or the City of Durham Traffic Department had told us to install a right turn lane, we would do it. I, I advise the council, as I advise the Board of Adjustment, it is not appropriate for lay people to give traffic advice uh, to the City Council. It's important to rely upon the experts in the City's Transportation Department and NCDOT, and that is addressed thoroughly in your staff report. Um, last, I do want to stress that um, we have doubled the silt fence, so we are going to take extra measures to make sure that uh, during construction, the environment is protected. This is an environmentally sound project. If these issues that were raised by, the issue, by, by uh, these folks um, had significant merit, they'd be in your staff report. These issues are all addressed at the site plan issue. We have very thorough, comprehensive stormwater protection standards, and we will follow them and we are proud to do that. And so if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, but in, in regards to traffic, stormwater, and the environment, we believe this is a great project. Oh, and sorry, and just one thing, just to make sure it's clear on the record, the bus stop is a committed element as part of this development plan. Uh, if, if there is any question about that, uh, there should not be. As, as, as you know, I was chairman of the Durham Area Transit Authority for many years, so I look at this issue carefully with every project. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Our development team is here from Envision and our engineering firm. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. But this project complies with our comprehensive plan, follows all of our regulations, and provides housing for the missing middle. In our that is our belief, and uh, we're happy to uh, answer any questions the council may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Biker. Uh, Council members, uh, you have heard from the speakers on both sides of the issue. Let me ask first, is there anyone else here tonight who would like to be heard on this issue? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this issue? Right, Council members, questions and comments at this point? Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Council Member Middleton. For, for the opponents, and I don't know if you have a designated spokesperson or not, I'd like to ask the opponents, um, first a statement, um, our city's growing. Um, there are 20 families moving here a day. The, the, I used to live in Park Ridge off of, off of uh, 54. I was broke. I had just gotten out of Duke and uh, had a wonderful apartment at Park Ridge Estate, some of the best days of my life. And I, I love the trees in that area. So I've watched our city grow. Um, those parcels are not going to stay empty forever. So I, I'm wondering if one of the opponents Tell us what you envision happening there. Because um, I'd like to tell you that nothing's going to happen and the, the area is going to remain as it is forever. But I'm, I'm wondering if any of the opponents, what, if you could put something there yourselves, what would you put there? We stated from the beginning we are not against housing. We completely agree with what you're saying. But there are questions that have not been answered, and that's the problem. So you're familiar with the area. Here's the area map that I wanted you to see. You can see the area for the rezone is surrounded by low density, so it is out of character. In addition to that, this is Park Ridge here, so that is the higher density. This is what happened at Park Ridge when it rained last week. Mm -hmm. We don't want this. This happened at another community next to us after it was said to be sufficiently addressed. We need this answered. When we ask about the stormwater precautions, they told us, don't worry, the engineer will figure it out. That's just not good enough. Mm. So we're not against housing. We just want it done right. Other questions and comments? Council Member Middleton, anything else? This I do have a question for the staff. I guess that would be appropriate when you call. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Would you, would you just ask the question, please, Council Member Middleton, to make sure we know which staff can answer it. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm just curious about something in the staff conclusion. Um, this, not, well, I guess Clause F, um, Development <coughs> Impact Assessment. And there, there just seems to be a curious formulation uh, to me. There is a decrease of one student generated 
in the proposed development compared to the current zoning. As a result, there will be no payment to Durham Public Schools. I'm wondering if, it is, if it's a decrease of one student, the proportional response is not a decrease in payment, but eradication of it. I'm just wondering what, what the metric, the formula that was used to. Yeah, uh, Jamie Sanyak with the planning department. Typically, the way that the proffers have been written is that the payment is for any increase in the number of students from the existing zoning to the proposed. That is the way that the language has typically been. So in this case, there is no gain in school-age children. So, um, so it was determined that the proffer, there would be no proffer. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments, council members? Council member Freeman? Um, I honestly, I probably should have prefaced this question prior to, but I really wanted to, to know from all of the opponents whether you live up or downstream from this project. Um, I'm going to ask one or two of the opponents who may know the answer to that question in your case to come to the podium if you'd like to answer that question. Anybody want to volunteer that? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I could say up or downstream. I'm right well, across from the, creek, the from stream borders between my home and, and the development. Uh, it's different for each of us. Um, so I, I would say there's nobody um, in our Woodcroft community that's um, downstream of this development. I think it's correct to say. Okay. And the, um, the picture specifically for the flooding, I just wanted to know if that was specific, like if that was directly near that property or if it was actually in the neighborhood itself. I understand the stream flow correctly. The stream progresses between our properties and the one in question and flows on through or past Parkwood. So I believe that that stream, I don't know what roads were shown in those photos, but that stream goes under the entrance to Parkwood. Okay. So it is likely that that, it is likely that more prompt runoff in that stream would cause quicker rises downstream at Parkwood. Again, I don't know what those specific streets were, so I'm not sure if they are involved. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Biker? If, if I could, Council Member Freeman, just to amplify that question, I think this is responsive to what you were asking. Uh, in regards to um, the houses that are already in Woodcroft, part of the issue with, with uh, stormwater in relation to those houses is that they were built in what today would be stream buffer areas. We did not have stream buffer standards when Woodcroft was built in the 80s. Accordingly, a number of the houses, um, some of the houses of the speakers tonight, they're actually built within what are jurisdictional stream buffers today. So if they're already built within the additional stream buffers, how is it, how is it that you would, I'm, I'm trying to understand how the water standards would be in place to prevent any flooding in that area for any new development? Especially if you're mass right. rating. Right. The offsite, the the post construction runoff needs to match what is currently on site today. But if they're so that's, if they're flooding. Right, but that's you just match flooding and that makes sense? No, they're they're if they are, it's it's flooding from a watershed that's far greater than the six and two thirds acres that's before the council tonight. In regards six to that and six two and two thirds, thirds acres. acres is the is will be the post-construction runoff will not be any more than it is today, given given the way the Durham stormwater standards work. Say that to me again. I'm sorry, I'm missing it. Yeah. The six and two thirds acres that they're showing right. in that picture mm -hmm. as the development site would not add any more water to their current flooding in that Woodcroft neighborhood. That's correct. Okay. How is that possible? I I'm, I live near uh, Golden Bell, and the the runoff is always in our streets. I'm, I'm concerned. Councilman Freeman, if I might, we, we have representatives from our stormwater uh, division of Public Works Department tonight who can maybe elaborate on that. Uh, Jennifer Buzzin and Michael Arwin. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Young. <sighs> Good evening, Mayor uh, Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Julian uh, Johnson, and City Council members. I'm Michael Irwin from the Public Works Stormwater Development Review Section, and I'm here to answer any of your questions. 
So based on what uh, the attorney and the community are saying <laughs> about the stormwater runoff, they're in a stream buffer already, and this new development being 6.23, I'm sorry, 32 acres? 6.62 acres being mass graded and developed on would not produce any more water for those houses that are already in the stream buffer. We have rules and regulations in place that um, limit uh, two-year and 10-year um, peak flows that we have to detain those on site. And we have the option of requiring 100-year peak flow detention be required on site if there are downstream situations that would be negatively impacted by a crease in the 100-year peak flow, such as the culverts underneath that, uh, the roadway of that existing development. Okay. So. And would that culvert be connected to any other, like, waterway? Like, how do you actually alleviate the issue of the flooding so that even though they're going in afterwards with a development plan and creating a, a way for water to flow away from them, is there any way to tie it back into that? What you would have to do is you would have to increase the size of the culverts underneath that existing roadway in order to pass the additional flows, and that would require a detailed engineering analysis to uh, determine what the uh, size of that culvert needs to be. Okay. How do we get a detailed analysis of that before this happens? Um, it, it's a simple hydraulics and hydrology calculation using the rational or SES method to generate peak flow based upon pervious and impervious area existing in the watershed and proposed in the watershed, and then Ms. Boozin. <laughs> um, there isn't any- Could you introduce any yourself? For the, oh, Jennifer Buzzin, um, Public Works, Stormwater Development Review. There isn't any point in the rezoning process where this analysis is done. If the rezoning passes, that analysis will be done at the site plan stage. Does that address your question? It does, but it pre presents the the issue that the residents are complaining about is not having an answer before right. a developer moves forward. And if the reason that we're doing it this way is just because we've done it in the past, then we need to figure out how to address it so that they have the answer beforehand. Well, that would that would take a, a change in all the rules for of the planning process, which is not going to happen for this case, I presume. Um, it's certainly something worth considering, but the city does have stormwater standards. They are applied to every site plan, and every site plan has to meet those minimum requirements. I'm going to say again that I live in an area where the streets flood based on a new development that was put in place with the city's stormwater requirements. That is not enough. That, that could be true. Um, it is true. It's not could yeah. be. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer, don't, don't argue, please. Just let it go. Okay. Come. Council member, I'm going to ask for other questions and comments by other council members. Council I just want to I just want to just um, kind of hone in on the, the context of how if we're moving forward with these projects and recognizing that, which, I mean, just in the same way we're having a conversation about schools and charters and everything else, if we're going to address the issues that the city values, then we need to make sure that we're doing that through our processes. And that means making sure that, that citizens, that residents in this community have answers to those questions before a developer's coming forward with a plan that, that could or could not pre pre present more flooding than they're already received or that they're already having in their community based on the fact that they were built in the 80s. It's not like it's either side's problem. It is the city's issue. And I'm trying to figure out how we come up with a solution that addresses it on a whole, as opposed to this case by case, where everyone's arguing back and forth based on whether or not the water will flow in that direction. Thank you. Council members, other questions and comments? Um, Mayor. Council member Austin. Uh, just briefly, thank you. Um, I just want to address the, um, the ethical situation. Thank you, um, Mr. City Attorney, for the update. Um, and I just want to say, you know, uh, Everyone who comes before us should be allowed to make a living, but I think, you know, uh, the failure of the applicant's attorney to um, disclose the timeline of your relationship to the applicant uh, in a more timely manner, uh, to me, triggered an ethical violation. Um, and so I, I plan to vote for this rezoning, but you know, I can't do so without 
um, saying that publicly and to just hope that um, this situation uh, will encourage um, your firm and, and firms like it to uh, make greater efforts to be more transparent um, to the extent that you're consistent with your attorney-client relationship and privilege, uh, to be more transparent when these kinds of situations arise. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Councilmember Austin. Any questions, comments? Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to uh, thank my colleagues for their great remarks. I, remarks. I especially want to be mindful, um, <coughs> excuse me, of Commission of Councilmember Freeman's uh, frustration at the current state of the stormwater protection measures that are in force in the city. Um, and I think that's something we all need to be mindful of and uh, continue to make sure that everything that we are permitted to do as a city to protect our water and to protect uh, other commu downstream communities from the impacts of these kinds of developments we are doing. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. I also, uh, like my colleague, Councilmember Alston, need to uh, direct uh, a set of remarks uh, to uh, the applicant's former council uh, the planning commissioner who um, appeared before us last time, as I told him in a meeting earlier today, um, it's my view and the, plan the county manager took a different view and that is his job, but I can read the code of ethics that the uh, Board of County Commissioners promulgates for county officials. And in that code of ethics, um, uh, folks in the commissioner's uh, position are required to conduct themselves at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity of the office uh, of which they, for which they serve. Uh, in, in my view, um, the fact that the planning commissioner took a job uh, representing before this body uh, an applicant for whose application he uh, voted f on behalf of in the planning commission uh, violates that particular portion of the code of ethics. Uh, I told him that earlier today. I also told him that it was my uh, suspicion that the county would not find a violation, and they did not. Um, but I think, uh, as with uh, Councilmember Alston, I felt like it was uh, <coughs> incumbent upon me, not only as a member of the council, but also as an attorney, to express that. Um, I don't. I don't have any opinion on the on the state bar issues. That'll that's for other people to to worry about. Um, uh, although, quite frankly, I will say I don't I don't understand what would be the basis of that violation here. Uh, with respect to the known conduct uh, of the commissioner in question. Uh, turning to the, to the substantive issues that are posed by this rezoning, I, I had the privilege uh, to go to the neighborhood uh, several months ago and uh, spend some time with the residents of this neighborhood. Uh, they impressed me uh, with their understanding of the issues involved, uh, their uh, commitment to a neighborhood that they love and a city that they want to see grow just as all of us do. Uh, in a responsible manner. Um, when I met with them uh, and spoke to them about this particular case, the message that I delivered, that I don't know whether it was welcome or not, um, was that the, the question for the city council in fa when we're facing this rezoning is not between the, the conditions on the ground in that piece of property that exist today and the plan presented us to us by developers about what they want to do with it. That is not the choice before us. The choice is between what the developer can do by right today without asking the city for a single bit of permission um, versus what they're coming with uh, before us today. That's the choice we have. And I might wish we lived in a world where neighbors could decide when a property has been sold to a developer and a rezoning has been applied for, that no, they'd, they'd prefer to have the woods. Um, I'd prefer to have the woods if I were you. I absolutely understand that. It's gorgeous out there. Um, but the fact is these folks own this property and have a right to do things to it, and we don't have a right to tell them not to do that. Um, and so looking at what they're entitled to do by right and what they're planning to do in this particular rezoning I have to say that the rezoning uh, is much better than what they could do by right. I know I heard one person say he doesn't see how that's possible, or another person say the, the plan proposed by the developers is, is one of the worst things they can imagine. Well, 
they are offering and have committed to do a ton of stuff that they don't have to do if this gets rejected. And um, the, the 40 feet tree safe buffer uh, around the edge of this property, the additional setback from the tree line for the, uh, for the actual construction of the buildings, those are not required by the UDO. They are, there are requirements, but they're not nearly that generous. Um, and that's just one area where the developer has uh, tailored their project uh, to uh, try to accommodate to the extent that they felt uh, they could the concerns of the folks in the neighborhood. Now, would I have preferred some of the types of buffers that I heard folks advocating for here today? Absolutely. But I don't have the authority to force them to do that. Um, that's not what this body is empowered to do. Um, and it's uh, unfortunate, it's frustrating for us sometimes, and I understand that the fact that this property exists behind y'all's houses in a, in a state that you like uh, means that you are invested in wanting to keep it that way. I totally understand that. But the fact is, it's not going to stay that way. These folks bought it. They're going to do something with it. Let's get the benefits we can out of the out of the plan that they've provided to us, which, by the way, got significantly better since the last time we saw it uh, back in June. Um, and that was that was what I explained to the folks that I met with. Um, and that's the same reasoning that we're faced with today, except when I met with you before, um, the buffers weren't as big um, and the developer had not offered to add additional um, silting intervention during a really critical time in any site development, the construction phase, which is a time that many of us have talked about uh, with our planning staff and with, other, with each other about the fact that that is a time when developers are not required to have the in-place completed uh, stormwater facility, um, and yet they have the authority under our code to uh, do a lot of mass grading that can cause a huge amount of erosion um, and silting uh, in nearby waterways. And that's something that the developer has offered uh, to double the silting barriers, uh, which I think will uh, help. Um, but this is by no means a perfect resolution uh, to the desire of the developer to develop and the desire of the folks in the neighborhood to retain what they love about this piece of property. But there is no perfect resolution. There's, there's just what we have. Um, and for that reason, I'll be voting for the rezoning tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member. Other council members' comments or questions? Can I? Council I, just wanna, I just wanna make a word of caution and to my council members here and colleagues. Um, in this case, particularly, when you're moving from RS-20 to PDR, there is a difference. And recognizing that that is the discretion that we, we as a council have on whether or not we wanna move forward and making, um, more of a waterway issue for a community or not. And that is not by right. So the developer could make the, make the decision to come in and propose any zoning that they'd like. It does not mean that you have to approve it. It is not a given. There's no uh, basis for you to just move forward because it's something that they submitted. It actually should be um, something that you look at and, and kind of investigate whether or not it's for the, the greater benefit of the city. Um, I actually uh, don't see the benefit of having this rezoning, and I will not be supporting it. The existing RS-20 is, is fine. If the planned development residential for 3.940 were, <sighs> I mean, I just wanna reframe the context to make sure that we're recognizing that this is not by right that you change zoning. Thank you, Council Member. Other comments and questions? Council Member Caballero. I have a quick question for staff. Could what is the... Could you ask the question? Yeah, okay. the tree buffer for just by by right, I know they've, ex they've made the tree buffer much bigger than what they would have to do if they just went in there, and I'm just curious what that is. The requirement would be 20%. Okay. 20% one, not even. 20% opacity. No. Oh, you're talking about, I'm sorry, on the southern end? I'm just, yeah. yeah. 
because they've 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 made that much bigger is my understanding and so i'm just trying to wrap my head because i'm hearing two issues which is one around the water and the other one's around the trees and so if if this is denied the land's bought the development the developer can then just go in by our own code and so i'm trying to get my head around what the tree situation would look like well if i understand your your question correctly you're, are you looking for the difference in the tree buffer from the existing zoning to the adjacent mm -hmm. so from the RS20 to the RS20, I don't believe there would be a buffer. Right. I'm sorry, Art. Right. So there, there would be, if so if they were do, building under the current zoning, Correct. which is the RS20, excuse me, to the RS10, there would be no buffer that would be required. Thank you. They will do grazing. This is what I'm saying. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anybody else want to make any comments on this? I have a comment I'd like to make. Um, I, I do think that that I think that the, the the council has been very troubled, and I want to associate myself with self with Councilmember Austin and Councilmember Reese's comments about the about the process. I understand very well why the neighbors were shocked when you went to the planning commission and then you came to the city council meeting and you saw that the person who'd spoken against this at the, or in favor of this at the planning commission was then representing the developer. I was shocked as well. And that is why the council kept this public hearing open rather than acting on it at our last meeting so that we could give thoughtful consideration to the meaning of that and the extent to which the process was tainted. And I know for myself, the question was, was I able to make a rational and, and uh, unprejudiced decision uh, given the given the uh, situation with the uh, with the process? And I felt, and I believe the council feels, that we are able to make that decision. Um, and we also wanted at that time to uh, uh, deal with that appropriately, which turned out to be uh, the fact that this was a county matter and was turned over to the county. So, uh, but yes, uh, you know, it, it was very troubling to me. Uh, it, was, it, it remains troubling, and um, I can very well understand the reasons that the neighborhood thinks that the process was tainted in that way, and I believe it was tainted. Nevertheless, I do believe that the council is prepared to make a decision on the merits. I know that I feel prepared to make a decision on the merits, notwithstanding what happened with the process. And I think the merits are much as uh, Council Member Reese described. That is to say, uh, I, I believe that the, uh, the, uh, that the proffers that the developers have made uh, in terms of the 34% impervious surface limiting to that, uh, the, the double silt fence, uh, the the additional uh, tree buffer offered um, are all significant and I think in many ways better than what could be built in terms of the single family homes by right. Um, and I also agree with Council Member Reese. I know that we would all like to and have a forest behind our homes. I've, I went to the neighborhood twice. I went before the last rezoning. Uh, I mean, before the last uh, meeting when we discussed it, and after that discussion, I drove out there again <clears throat> and looked. And uh, it, is a, it is wonderful to have that in your backyard. Um, but I think that given the choices before us, which is by right as a single family development where uh, there would not be these buffering requirements, uh, as opposed to what is being proffered here, I think that this is, um, this is reasonable um, and in many ways preferable. Uh, so I'll be voting uh, for this as well. Uh, let me just add a couple of small things that I, I, I also want to say that there was this concern, the concern about the right bound west turn, westbound right turn lane. Um, I felt that the, um, my concerns uh, about this and whether or not it, it should be uh, proffered uh, were answered at the previous meeting, and I feel comfortable that this is the right decision given traffic out there. 
Um, and, uh, and also the question uh, th that, if necessary, there will be the bus pullover. Uh, and I think that is essential. And uh, as my understanding is that has been proffered uh, if, it is deter if its necessity is determined by our transportation staff. Um, okay. Other council members have any comments or questions? Mr. Mayor, I do want to say, and I appreciate your comments, with respect to proffers, th th they are by their very nature arbitrary and not formulaic. And just, I want to just hearken back to the, the notion of a decrease in one student being generated from the proposed development compared to current zoning, and then the language, as a result, there will be no payment. It implies that there's a formula or an equation. Um, whether there's a decrease or not, the, I just want it to be clear that the, the, the developers are free to still make a proffer to uh, Durham Public Schools, um, notwithstanding the seeming formulaic language. And I'm assuming this is the developer's language, not the staff's language. So I just want to make it clear, you, there's no formula. You guys are free to do that uh, if you want to. Thank like you, you did with the other stuff. Thanks. Other comments or questions? All right, uh, if there are none, uh, I'm going to declare that this public hearing is closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, the I can get my, uh, is there a motion to adopt a consistency statement as acquired by NCGS 168-383? Move to adopt. Second. Been moved and seconded to adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-1 with Council Member Freeman voting no. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt an ordinance amending the United Unified Development Ordinance. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The UDO passes by a vote of 6-1 with Council Member Freeman voting no. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to thank you and I want to thank the neighbors uh, that came out tonight. I know this is not the outcome that you wanted, uh, but we appreciate your participation. and. Uh, very much that you very much appreciate you being here. Thank you. Could you direct me to get the USB key that we uh, the USB we, we, for the pictures? Somebody took it, and we just need it back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Vivian, if you can hear us, I believe you have the USB, uh, and if you could make your way to the back and make it available to these folks. It's plugged in right there. Thank you. We're now going to hear item twenty-eight, the Durham Beltline trail master plan and um, we'll begin by hearing from staff good evening mayor and council members uh, my name is Dale McKeel I am I work with the City Durham <coughs> Transportation Department, and we are here tonight to talk about the Durham Beltline Trail Master Plan. Uh, the city uh, received a Tiger planning grant uh, a few years ago, and for the last 18 months, we have been working on this master plan uh, with our uh, consultant, uh, Stewart Engineering. I want to introduce uh, Todd Delk with Stewart, who will... Um, begin the presentation to discuss the recommendations of the Beltline Trail Master Plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. Uh, Todd Delk, uh, Stewart Engineering, uh, 223 Southwest Street, Raleigh. Um, it's been our pleasure and honor to be working on this plan over the last 18 months. Um, uh, we've been really excited to put together this master plan um, and sort of vision uh, for the Durham Beltline. Um, I wanted to uh, introduce you to a couple of our staff that are here today to help pr present, um, and those include Jackie Turner, uh, who is a, a planner in our office and headed up in public involvement uh, for the uh, uh, master plan. 
Uh, Jake Petrosky has uh, sort of been our head uh, lead on the design and planning side of uh, putting together the master plan. And also we have a special consultant, uh, Kofi Boone, um, professor of landscape architecture who helped us out with environmental um, justice and uh, a crime prevention through uh, environmental design uh, for the project as well. Um, we'd also be remiss to not acknowledge the amount of uh, staff time uh, and several uh, of our steering committee mem members that are here tonight uh, in the audience that I've seen throughout the audience as well as the folks that uh, help participate in the public involvement of the project um, as well. Uh, the Durham Beltline is envisioned to be a rail, trail, and a linear park that'll be 1.7 miles in length um, and using the abandoned rail line that Norfolk Southern has uh, through the western and northern part of downtown. Uh, it connects neighborhoods north of downtown uh, to the downtown itself as well as a number of multimodal uh, transit hubs downtown, both the bus station, the Amtrak, and the future Durham Orange Light Rail Station. The trail provides regional connections uh, to the American Tobacco Trail as well as the Mountain to Seas Trail and is, will actually in the future be part of the East Coast Greenway uh, through the city of Durham. The city has long um, planned this trail uh, along this corridor and several instances tried to buy this uh, piece of right away from Norfolk Southern. Uh, but in 2017, the Conservation Fund was actually able to acquire this property from Norfolk Southern um, and hold it for the city of Durham for this future project that y'all have had in your plans for so long. Uh, the uh, rail line was actually built back in about uh, 1890 by Brody Duke and was put in place to pretty much bypass the North Carolina Railroad Company so he didn't have to pay his fees. Um, and work with the scheduling out there. Uh, when this was built, it split apart several of the communities in North Durham um, and had a, a number, and it was used a lot for the uh, warehouse, tobacco warehouses and linen uh, factories that were along the corridor, which included Pearl Mill Village and many of the warehouses you see in the western part of Durham right now. Um, Norfolk Southern purchased this from uh, the Dukes uh, back in the uh, early 1900s, and the last train ran on it somewhere in the 1980s or 1990s, and over the last 10 years, it's been uh, abandoned and basically planned for as a greenway um, by several different uh, organizations, including Durham Parks and Rec and the Durham Open Space uh, and Trail Committee. Uh, if you go out to the uh, rail line out there today, this is what you see in some of the more uh, uh, urban settings in downtown that it runs through. Um, some of the sections have actually been adopted by adjacent landowners uh, and pretty well maintained, but the vast majority of it is fairly well overgrown with weeds, um, ivy, and uh, different uh, flora all over it. Um, just wanted to give you a brief introduction to the trail, um, and with that, I'm going to let uh, Jackie come up and give us a little bit more information about the public involvement and uh, our visioning uh, and goal setting for this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie Turner with Stewart Engineering. Um, I do want to um, begin with saying that um, both my parents were uh, born and raised in Durham, and so I've been, uh, though I haven't lived in Durham, I've been uh, coming here for a long time, and I was excited to be a part of this project. Um, at the time I started on this project, I actually worked for another firm, and then I moved to Stewart and continued, so it's a little bit of background about that. Um, I, we, we began this project with a public involvement plan that we sat down with staff and then presented to a steering committee that talked about the uh, outreach that we would have throughout the project. And as Todd mentioned, we worked with the steering committee. We held stakeholder meetings. And I will. Let's see here. It's showing up here on my screen. There we go. Um, so we uh, had worked with uh, stakeholders and uh, had several interviews, some as groups, some with uh, as individuals. Uh, we worked with uh, staff, we worked with downtown um, uh, development group to try to uh, figure out who our outreach would be and, uh, and then began those conversations. 
In, also in the early stages, we decided to look at some of other precedent trails um, because right from the start, we were told that we wanted to make this particular trail or linear park uh, something that would be that could be known uh, regionally and maybe even nationally. We wanted it to be of high quality and a, a real uh, amenity for the city. We looked at uh, the design features and amenities and funding, funding strategies for the um, High Line, Atlanta Belt Line, um, and these are just some of them, but we actually, as a group, along with staff in the steering committee, took a trip to Greensboro that is working on its own downtown Greenway for some lessons learned. The, um, so we can uh, talk a little bit more about those, the details of, of some of those projects may come up in the rest of the presentation that Jake will be doing. But we began the process with over, um, with, with a uh, pop-up events at City of Durham events. For instance, we had a booth at the uh, Eno River Festival, at the Center Arts Festival, and then we held a, a workshop that was well attended in uh, fall, I think in September of 2017. So between that effort and a survey and the other groups that I mentioned, we have reached over 1,000 participants um, in the last uh, really what has been about a year, not even a year and a, uh, not quite a year and a half, um, to get uh, input. When we realized in, uh, in October after our initial input that there were groups that we were not uh, yet reaching, we also uh, held some additional meetings that were not part of our original plan. For instance, we did a presentation um, at PAC4 at the J.J. Henderson um, Housing a complex to take our message to um, to other citizens that that had not necessarily participated. The word cloud that you see on the the schedule um, up on the slide here is from our first survey, which was uh, in August of 2017. And the largest words are the words that were mentioned um, over and over again throughout that particular process. The response, in the at least in the survey and in the feedback, we had uh, uh, almost 200 people attend the first workshop back in September of 2017. Um, had been o has been overwhelmingly positive in terms of having a linear park uh, because the corridor is not just a narrow, like 12 foot wide um, alignment. There's a lot of opportunity um, to do other things there from the photos that um, Todd just showed, and so. Uh, other than the, uh, the workshops that we held, the additional outreach we had in October, we realized as the plan was developed over the winter and the spring that we needed to really uh, kick up the um, outreach and also based on uh, comments that, that we had heard in communities we felt that had not been involved. So for the second workshop, which was held in June of 2018, we, um, we, there were 495 residences um, to which postcards were mailed, um, and those were located within 500 feet of the Beltline itself. Um, the announcements, we had flyers, um, and as well as the postcards, those were sent to six churches that were near the corridor, um, and there were yard signs at six intersections in the area, and also posters were placed in 52 businesses and institutions in and around the area. So those were some of the efforts to get, and, and so at that June workshop, we also had a fairly good turnout and a fairly diverse turnout. So a couple of the things is that we have used all of the feedback from the, the meetings over the last year and including um, the workshop uh, this year to uh, sort of <coughs> set a vision for the, for the Beltline um, Trail Master Plan. And it's up there, uh, well, the, the, you know, the vision is to be a vibrant green space connecting communities to the heart of Durham. The, um, let's see here. I think that was about all that I was going to talk to. You can see that inscribed on the rail there is a quote from Langston Hughes. Um, back on the previous slide. And then Jake's going to talk a little bit about the, um, the efforts and more of the design focus for the project. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions regarding um, engagement efforts later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner. 
Jake Petrowski with Stewart Engineering. Um, <clears throat> so we had the overall vision, um, and as to accompany that, we talked about some goals, and uh, they were developed to kind of sound out some of the things we were hearing during the stakeholder interviews in the first survey and first public meeting. Um, one was to provide a safe and attractive trail for a variety of users. Um, the second, uh, incorporate engaging, innovative design that's uniquely Durham. Um, uh, the third, improve quality of life by increasing access to green space, art, culture, and history. Uh, and the fourth, uh, enhance and preserve communities and ensure equitable access. Um, these goals are also accompanied by a number of um, planning principles um, and, and design principles uh, that further elaborate them and, and specify some objectives. Uh, they're, they're meant to be um, uh, uh, a capture uh, of the input um, at, at the time, and they're meant to evolve with the Beltline um, as well. So that's an important point. Uh, the, the trail uh, itself is, it really traverses three distinct areas. Uh, one is the urban section. Um, on this slide, it's the, the green area uh, that begins kind of in downtown and extends up to Trinity Avenue. Um, this is where uh, there's going to be uh, the most traffic in terms of users. Uh, it's uh, envisioned to be, uh, have a separate bicycle zone and pedestrian zone that's actually illustrated in the top right. Um, and accommodate uh, high volumes of, of, of pedestrians and, and bicyclists and, and joggers and dog walkers and um, uh, uh, strollers and, and all of the above. Um, if we're successful in this, um, we're going to need that separation uh, in order to uh, keep a safe trail uh, for all users. Um, the preservation and restoration section uh, from Trinity uh, Avenue uh, up to uh, about Glendale um, is where the trail transitions from an urban context uh, into um, uh, something a little different. On uh, the west side is the South Ellerbee Creek uh, stormwater restoration area, uh, and on the right is the historic Pearl Mill Village. Um, so we want to be uh, sensitive uh, of those um, natural and, and historic assets through this, this area, and, and also uh, look for opportunities for restoration as well, which I'll talk about later. Uh, the neighborhood section, uh, really beginning in the vicinity of um, Glendale and extending eastward, um, really changes context again. Uh, there's adjacent residential development and lower expected volumes uh, in terms of users, uh, and uh, the character of the trail uh, can change again there. Um, some precedents uh, that we looked at uh, for the preferred cross section, this, again, this in the urban, urban section and would be built where um, right away allows, uh, is the Indianapolis Cultural Trail and the Katy Trail in, in Dallas, and those are pictured uh, on this slide. Uh, the constra constrained section, uh, which is uh, pictured on the top left, um, would be for road crossings, uh, where you want to bring users together and cross the road in a uh, safe fashion. Um, or where elevation or right-of-way constraints uh, necessitate a smaller footprint. Uh, the neighborhood cross-section uh, is uh, in that more uh, neighborhood area, uh, and it's meant to be a little bit smaller footprint um, and have a 12-foot uh, greenway and a, a natural surface uh, path beside it for walking or jogging. Uh, that's something that um, a lot of the feedback we heard uh, wanted to include, if, if at all possible. The uh, next few slides, I'll provide uh, a bit more detail on the conceptual design of the trail in, in some key areas. Uh, this is the southernmost uh, uh, section of the trail, uh, adjacent to the future light rail station, which is on the left, uh, the pink building on your left. Um, the railroad track um, uh, exists uh, right next to it. Um, and then um, there's uh, an opportunity uh, for urban park. Um, um, kind of framed by Chapel Hill Street and Morgan, um, and then Great Jones Street uh, on, on the bottom. Uh, for this uh, planning purposes, the conceptual design was, was factoring in a potential two-way conversion of Great Jones Street, uh, just because if uh, uh, Great Jones Street does not get two-wayed, uh, then there's a, a bigger footprint, but we wanted to see the worst-case scenario there. Um, uh, there's also some alternatives for this urban park, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's city-owned uh, land adjacent to the trail. Uh, it could be repurposed for a public space. Um, uh, it could be uh, home to a, a new museum of a Durham history building uh, or uh, uh, 
infill development, uh, whatever you choose, but we are showing it uh, as, a, as a public space to, um, to uh, kind of uh, illustrate the possibilities. Uh, precedents for this space include North End Park in, in Boston, City Garden in St. Louis, uh, or Romere Bearden Park uh, in Charlotte. As we move north across Fernway, uh, we move into what uh, could be the gateway of the Innovation District. Uh, this could be one of the busiest sections of the trail. Uh, trail oriented development uh, is likely on both sides of the trail, um, and we are showing uh, the preservation of some key historic assets in this area. One is the railroad gantry uh, that could be either a gateway to the Innovation District or if you're passing uh, uh, southward, uh, it could be a gateway into downtown. Um, the view opens up and you can see downtown skyline there. Uh, there's also a historic railroad trestle in this section. Uh, that is currently on private land, um, but uh, we are showing uh, the preservation of that, um, uh, and we would have to work with, the city would have to work with uh, landowners on that, but it is a, a great uh, opportunity, uh, placemaking opportunity, and an opportunity to preserve a piece of your railroad pass. It also has uh, great views of the evolving skyline of downtown Durham, uh, which would be nice. Um, like, uh, so this, uh, Conceptual illustration shows what the trail could look like through the Innovation District. Um, active uses uh, are recommended for the building edges, especially at uh, key uh, intersections with key public roads. Um, a threaded path uh, could weave around a preserved section of rail. Um, and saving or replanting the tree canopy uh, is recommended here. Um, moving northward uh, across uh, Trinity Avenue, uh, we get to that, that preservation and restoration section. Uh, connecting people to the South Ellerbury Creek wetland project is a priority here. Um, it's very rare that a, that a city um, of your size uh, has an opportunity to have a wetland park uh, of, of, of the order that's uh, being contemplated for that uh, within less than a mile of their downtown. Uh, so that's something that we would like to connect people to. Um, this section also connects to South Ellery Creek Trail, uh, which is a signed portion of the East Coast Greenway, a trail from Maine to Florida. Um, and making that connection is a priority uh, uh, is in this section as well. Uh, lighting on the trail in this area would have to be sensitive uh, to the historic Earl Mill Village area. Uh, and on this area, the trail will be on uh, an elevated uh, piece of ground um, the railroad bed uh, and making sure we have uh, uh, downward facing um, uh, sensitive lighting uh, that doesn't interfere with those residents is important. Uh, there's also a lot of opportunity for uh, environmental art and education along this trail uh, just given the context. As the trail crosses Washington Street, we're recommending a crossing plaza with pavers that slows vehicular traffic for the safety of trail users. We're also recommending uh, crosswalks at Dacian and Macon uh, in order to slow traffic on the approach. That was something that a lot of uh, residents were very concerned uh, in this area about um, making sure that we uh, not only create a safe trail crossing, but to improve the safety of, of some of these existing crossings where there are barriers right now. Uh, in this area, you have a lot of properties that are zoned as light industrial, um, and reuse and redevelopment is possible in this area, and it's likely not to be uh, industrial. Uh, so thinking about how we can reduce barriers to missing middle housing types and encourage neighborhood scale affordable housing uh, is recommended uh, to help activate the trail edge uh, through here and elsewhere where you have that condition. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. As we move east, uh, there's an opportunity to preserve and restore an area around Strayhorn Springs, which is located just uh, uh, west of Glendale Avenue. Uh, pedestrian connections between Macon Street and North Street in this area uh, reconnecting those neighborhoods that were severed 125 years ago uh, is something that we're recommending. Um, continuing to move east, Mangum Street is an overpass on the trail. Um, this presents, uh, you know, an opportunity and a concern. A concern in that we want to make that a safe place. An opportunity in that elsewhere, um, turning those uh, underpasses into art opportunities uh, has been a successful uh, way to activate uh, those, those places. Um, City-owned land on Roxbury Street is envisioned to be a trailhead, and uh, the master plan also recommends locating a trailhead uh, with uh, some recreational facilities and programming in the vicinity of Avondale Drive. Uh, a lot of um, participants um, uh, lobbied heavily for uh, an, an access on Avondale Drive that is, is both a gateway to the trail and a trailhead. Additional outreach is recommended in the plan to determine the location and the design of this 
uh, trailhead uh, to fulfill neighborhood needs. So um, there's some unanswered questions uh, with this master plan, but again, there's a lot of things that needs to be uh, figured out during the design phase. Um, Access to open space and parks is a substantial need in downtown and along the northern and eastern part of the trail. Uh, the trail will increase access to open space by 52%. Um, based on a health analysis conducted, the eastern end of the trail has higher rates of obesity, heart disease, and mental health issues than the rest of Durham. <coughs> so this access uh, to, uh, to open space um, will certainly um, be in a good location. Uh, those lower than average health outcomes also correlate with uh, low incomes um, that we found in the uh, social equity analysis. Um, the master plan also recommends um, addressing affordable housing uh, to the degree it can. Uh, it's a, it was raised early in the process uh, and we work with uh, planning staff and Department of Community Development to make some recommendations encouraging infill and affordable housing along the trail. Um, strategies build on existing efforts by the city and other organizations to preserve existing affordable units and develop new affordable housing in close-in neighborhoods. Uh, this is an issue um, not only uh, uh, in uh, the trail corridor, but also in other parts of, of, of close-in neighborhoods. Uh, we looked at crime prevention uh, techniques uh, and built um, on the analysis uh, done of the ATT and created crossing plazas uh, that will help uh, define public and private space and also increase the safety of trail users. Preservation and restoration of the natural communities is a priority. Um, it's rare that uh, the city has an opportunity uh, to uh, accept um, 17 acres of new green space uh, uh, so close to downtown and in neighborhoods uh, in need of that green space. Um, so part of the next steps uh, is, is gonna go into documenting these communities um, and uh, enhancing them. The cost estimate is broken uh, out into uh, two pieces, the Beltline proper uh, with trail essentials and also uh, some other related costs uh, and other items, uh, 15.1 million for the trail and trail essentials. Uh, and then um, some other costs, including uh, parks and bioswales are listed on the right. Um, and they could be funded incrementally as grants or private funds uh, as they become available. Overall funding mix for all components of the trail uh, is shown in the plan. Um, and uh, overall, the funding mix is targeted to be a combination of local, federal, state, and private funds. Opportunities for value capture could be explored to fund priorities that federal funding uh, is not, uh, d doesn't uh, qualify things for. Um, the overall concept for the, the Beltline shows uh, amenities and key connections. Uh, the next steps include purchasing right away and moving into the actual design phase of the project, which will entail additional outreach and engagement to customize the design based on the needs of neighborhoods. There's two organizational structures uh, that were, uh, we looked at um, for the Beltline Trail. One is a single or multiple agency model that's led by the city of Durham. Another is a public-private model where there's a partner organization that plays a larger role. The tasks show, uh, shown in the bubbles below the options are simplified and could also include a number of other roles um, other than what's shown. Um, the potential for public-private partnerships is significant and the master plan provides a foundation for building these partnerships. A portion of the public space improvements along the trail uh, could be funded privately, as in other precedent projects. Indeed, a significant uh, amount of um, private funds have been pledged so far uh, for the project. Um, and this slide just shows an example of a donor wall from the Greensboro Downtown Greenway, and uh, also an example of funding opportunities that are available along the Philadelphia Rail uh, Park. Overall, the master plan recommends that the Beltline should be part of a greater equity uh, planning initiative uh, in Durham uh, that studies how uh, to improve equitable access to housing, uh, transit, jobs, and open space in close-in neighborhoods. Uh, this type of planning uh, would be beneficial before the Beltline is constructed and future public space and transportation improvements such as the Great Loop uh, proposed uh, by the Parks Foundation occurs uh, to the east and south of the trail. Uh, there's uh, this is uh, the beginning uh, of, of the process for the Beltline. There's more work to be done, uh, for sure. Uh, the master plan is meant to be the start of conversations. Um, decisions on commitments and, and metrics are, are needed uh, by public and private partners uh, that weren't necessarily in the scope of this master plan, but hopefully this plan will uh, start, um, uh, uh, start those conversations and move them forward. Uh, the implementation timeline for the plan is elaborated 
uh, in the master plan and includes at least three years before the Beltline is constructed. Uh, this provides ample time uh, to address concerns related to housing and equity through implementations of policy recommendations in the plan and equitable development planning efforts. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Any other, um, anything else from the uh, staff or consultants at this time? All right, thank you very much for an excellent report. We appreciate it. Um, we now have uh, several people who have signed up to speak on this, and then we will have comments and questions from the council. Um, we have quite a number of people, and it's late. So I'm going to uh, ask people to please speak for two minutes. Uh, and uh, let me count the number of people. Eleven people that we have signed up. I'm going to call your name, and as I call your name, if you'll please come over here to the right of the podium, uh, and um, in the order in which I call you, that would be great. Uh, John Martin, Jeff Bakalchuk, James Speed Rogers, James Nishimuta, Laura Stroud. Jim Sfara, Terry Lansdale, Diane Standard, Kristen Gorman, Jen McDuffie, Andrea Muffin Hudson. Let me just ask, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else? Okay. If you'd like to be heard on this item, you need to go to the table over here. And you need to fill out one of the yellow cards, okay? And once you've done that, we'll get you in line to speak as well. All right, I'm going to declare this public hearing open, and we're going to begin. Uh, Mr. Martin, you have two minutes. Please state your name and address. Um, thank you. Good evening. I'm John Martin. I live at 401 East Trinity Avenue in Old North Durham. Um, and I am the president of the Old North Durham Neighborhood Association. Uh, which uh, its board has endorsed this um, proposal. We do support the, the, the plan to go forward. Um, the Durham Beltline is the northern boundary of our whole neighborhood. It separates us from the Duke Park neighborhood. And the western part of the um, Beltline um, is just a little ways from the western part of our neighborhood. Um, and in putting this out, in not just to the board, but on the listserv, I mean, what many of the people in the neighborhood commented about was that they were tired of an overgrown, um, debris-strewn, um, impenetrable, um, abandoned railroad track around the neighborhood, and they would like to see something done with it. Um, having said that, in support of it, I do, do want to say that we have um, a particularly serious concern. When this is put forward, it is always shown as going to Avondale Drive. And one of the maps that the staff showed showed it going to Avondale Drive. But if you look on page 94 um, in the master plan, it says, a gateway and trailhead is envisioned for the trail in the vicinity of Avondale Drive. The exact location of this trailway has to be determined. Um, an intermediate trailway trailhead could be located near Greenleaf Street. Now, Greenleaf Street is a one-block street in the Duke Park neighborhood. With all due respect, a trailhead that ends at Greenleaf Street, a trail that ends there, is a trail to nowhere. We strongly believe it should go not only all the way to Avondale Drive, it should go under Avondale Drive and connect our neighborhoods with the commercial area that is across Avondale Drive. That would provide parking for people who wanted to use the trail, and it would also provide a means for us to get from our neighborhoods um, across. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. Mr. Bakalchuk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Jeff Bakalchuk. I am a former commissioner on the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission and a former commissioner on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission. One point of disclosure, um, I am employed by and a shareholder of Measurement Incorporated, and Measurement Incorporated owns property that abuts the proposed trail. Um, that said, trails represent a vital element of our transportation network. They provide a safe corridor 
for people who are disadvantaged economically and cannot afford a vehicle. It provides an opportunity for them to bike and walk in a grade separated <coughs> approach. One element of the master plan, and I'd like to commend Dale McKeel and the Department of Transportation staff and the staff at Stewart Engineering for doing a wonderful plan. One thing that they mention in the plan is converting the loop, the downtown loop, to two-way traffic. Two generations ago, our civic leaders made what we now generally consider in our community a poor decision to create the loop. That has stunted development of downtown. It has created an environment downtown where our streets are not as safe as they could be for pedestrians and bike riders. We have an opportunity now to rectify that. If we don't seize this opportunity now, ongoing development downtown adjacent to the loop will preclude the opportunity in the future to have a viable street grid and do it in an effective way. If we fail to do that now, future generations will look back <coughs> at our civic leaders now and regret the decision not to do that in the same way that we regret the decision to install the loop in the first place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. James Speed Rogers. Um, Mayor Schwell, Mayor, Schwell, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, and members of the council, thank you. Um, I'm Speed Rogers. Um, I live on 1007 Drew Street, um, just outside of downtown Durham. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of the Durham Beltline project. I think it uh, helps us achieve many of our, or move to achieve many of our goals as a city towards um, climate justice and transportation alternatives. Um, I would like to repeat and affirm um, the displacement concerns that many community members expressed at a um, Durham Beltline for All Equity event that I was fortunate enough to attend last week. Um, there were many concerns about potential impact on the community, um, and I believe those should be taken into consideration when pursuing the project. Um, with those concerns in mind, I would like the council to consider uh, providing some type of upzoning or affordable housing uh, component to this Beltline proposal to either add units or add affordable units along the Beltline. Um, and that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. Uh, we'll now hear from James Nishimuta. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. My name is James Nishimura. I live on 16 Sweet Bay Court. I'm a board member of Bike Durham. We are a nonprofit advocacy organization working for bike-friendly changes in Durham. Uh, we advocate for affordable, equitable, and safe mobility. Um, car ownership in the U.S. on average costs um, $8,500 a year. And people of color make up the largest share of U.S. households without access to a car. That's 25% of African Americans and 13% of the Latino community do not own a car. So clearly transportation is an equity issue. <laughs> people of color are the largest growing demographic in the uh, cycling community. Uh, these are typically the people who, you know, they don't have access to a car, so bicycling, bicycling is their way to get around. They have to bike. Um, however, 30, um, African Americans are 30 more, 30% 30 more likely to be killed than white cyclists. They're dis disproportionately uh, affected by poor uh, bike infrastructure and lower income neighborhoods. And um, lower, lower income neighborhoods have had the highest rates of bike and pedestrian accidents. So clearly the Beltline can serve as a safe and affordable transportation alternative. However, the U.S. has a, use, a history of disenfranchising people of color from the transportation opportunities, and Durham is no exception. We, didn't, we need to make sure that the community is involved in the planning, but more <coughs> importantly, that this won't displace the people that could potentially benefit from this the most. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nishimura. We'll now hear from Laura Stroud. Good evening, Council. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm, my name is Laura Stroud. I live at 912 Rose Hill Avenue. I am a member of the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. commission. 
I am um, a parks and recreation planner by trade, um, and I'm a resident of Durham. Um, I'm here tonight in part with the group Durham Beltline for everybody. I'd like to ask everyone here with them this evening to briefly stand to show the support for the, um, for the cause. A lot of us are already in line. <laughs> um, and I'm here this evening to request that the council pause in their approval of the Durham Beltline Master Plan. Now, this is a very difficult moment to pause here on the cusp of a master plan approval. Um, and people have been working on this plan for 10 years, and we absolutely acknowledge their visionary spirit and the wonderful design plan that Stuart has put together. But there are many more issues at play here than there were when this plan was envisioned 10 years ago. Um, in other communities, um, some of the case studies that the master plan uses, such as um, Manhattan, the um, Highline and the, uh, the Atlanta Beltline, uh, these projects have caused extreme and immediate gentrification along the trail corridors. Um, and we understand that that will be the case in Durham as well um, once this plan is approved and to move forward. There has yet to be a city, a growing city, where this type of high profile development has not caused displacement of existing residents through housing speculation, eviction, and people priced out of the homes that they've lived in for years. Um, there's also yet to be a city that has solved this problem. But we know that Durham is special. And we're not special because this wouldn't happen here. It, it absolutely would. And a lot of these folks will be speaking to um, the evidence for that. But we know that we in Durham can come up with a visionary solution to create neighborhood stabilization policies in advance of the approval of this master plan. Thank you, Ms. Stroud. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Jim Sparrow. Good evening. <clears throat> Jim Savar, 1114 14 Woodburn Road. Uh, I am a bicyclist and an advocate for affordable housing. I'm here to encourage the council to send the master plan back to the staff uh, for further review and clarification. This project has gotten off track. You've heard speakers talk about the importance of a trail that provides new access for biking, for hiking. But if you go to the project website, there is a very telling statement. The Durham Beltline project has tremendous transformational potential for downtown Durham. The transformers have diverted this project with extra amenities that are not central and have potential gentrifying effects on the area. Uh, the proposal devotes 10.6 million, and tonight we heard $11.3 million to amenities that are not essential to the main purpose. Uh, these investments could increase the costs of property and of housing uh, around the trail. The report states that one of the benefits uh, of the project is an estimated increase in real estate values of $6 million. The final version of the master plan includes a new section on equity, and it proposes to appoint an equitable development task force. The Beltline plan should include only the essential elements of a trail until the work of this task force is completed. Still, the memo from staff that came along with this item, with this item states that park amenities could be built at the outset or constructed uh, separately as funding becomes available. Uh, the connections to North East Central Durham need to be clarified and the uh, Kelly Bryant Trail integrated better into this plan. Uh, the master plan should be sent back to staff it should be returned with an implementation plan that focuses on trail essentials, on affordable housing, on connections to Northeast Central Durham, and on promoting equity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sparra. We'll now hear from Terry Lansdale. Hello, Mayor, City Council. Uh, I come from Charlotte, North Carolina. I am the Executive Director of BIPOC North Carolina. Uh, almost 20 years ago, I stood in front of a dais in Charlotte uh, advocating for a similar plan for our rail trail system for the Charlotte area transit system. Um, we're seeing the benefits of that now 20 years later. Um, you have an opportunity in front of you to make a generational decision. Uh, the design standards, the design, the final designs are not yet formulated, but the master plan gives you the framework, gives Stuart and your staff the framework to do its job and to execute the plan the way you desire it, the most beneficial for the community. 
Uh, I think there's other opportunities that uh, align this master, master plan um, with your previous Durham Walks plan, with your sustainability plans, um, with your bicycle and pedestrian plans in place. Uh, again, this is going to be a, a, an opportunity for Durham to uh, shine as a light for North Carolina and how we, we plan our transportation and active transportation future. And for me and for many, many people in North Carolina, Durham's fast becoming uh, a transportation tourism destination. The, the trails, the bicycle friendliness, the pedestrian friendliness that you're uh, incorporating into your budgets and your plans um, uh, really are a shining star for North Carolina. We hope that you continue to do uh, brilliant work here. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Lansdale, and thank you for coming all the way up from Charlotte to spend your two minutes of time with us here. <laughs> That's, a, that's a, a great civic commitment. Thank you. Perfect. Diane Standard, I'm sorry. It, uh, Diane Standard's next. Yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> we need to scare you off the podium there. Uh, so good evening. My name is Diane Standard. I'm here as chair of the Durham Human Relations Commission. Uh, this evening, I would just like to submit for the official record a report that the Human Relations Commission did on structural racism within the city of Durham, which you all have already received, um, and it was approved by the commission in June 2018. I'm just going to read a, some excerpts of that report as quickly as I can. Uh, structural racism is considered to be a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial inequity. We know that a compounding set of past and present policy decisions at each level of government has contributed to this racial equity, but we're particularly interested in how policy decisions by the city of Durham contribute to these disparities. One example of Durham's influence on racial disparities is the approval of the destruction of houses and businesses in Haiti for the construction of North Carolina Highway 147. Our report looks at racial disparities that persist in Durham today across areas of health, employment, education, and other areas, but I just want to highlight two examples this evening, housing and businesses. Um, we know that home ownership is rooted in a deep history of racial discrimination in the housing market, such as redlining, restrictive covenants, and even explicit exclusion from federal government benefits following the Great Depression. We see those outcomes still today. In Durham, the white home ownership rate is 66%, but the black home ownership rate is 41%. Further, in terms of businesses, on October 2014 report showed the city only spent 2.66% <coughs> of contracting for minority with, with minority owned and women owned firms and specific between 2012 and 2017. Specifically, the city awarded only 2% of contracts to black owned firms. So we know that, um, just to speed things up, we acknowledge that all disparities have multiple contributing factors uh, in addition to race, such as gender, economic status, sexual orientation. But it's undeniable that race is present at every step and must be addressed head on. So we encourage our local elected officials to examine um, race at the front end of its decision-making processes rather than waiting to react once disparities have manifested in Ms. our community. Ms. Standard, thank you very much. And so we encourage you to do so in this process. Thank you. Kristen Gorman. Hi, honorable councilmen and women and mayor. Uh, my name is Kristen Gorman. Um, I live at 721 Mill Spring Drive, which is in the Crowsdale Farm neighborhood. Um, I am a member of DOST, and I'm on the Trails uh, Subcommission. And I'm here tonight to raise some concerns I have about adopting the master plan for the Durham Beltline Trail in its current form. Um, I love trails, that's why I'm on the Trails Commission. Um, that would be the number one reason. Um, however, I'm not the only one that this trail is being built for. I'm not paying for it alone. Uh, after examining the effects of the Beltline in Atlanta on nearby property prices, which rose over 40% in four years, I'm not sure if residents in Old North Durham, um, you know, Duke Park, all of the adjacent neighborhoods are going to be financing the trail so much as financing their own displacement, and that is my number one concern. Um, well, actually, no. My other number one concern. Uh, I'm not at all confident that a polarity, a polarity of residents in these communities are aware of the changes soon to be underway in their backyards. Um, if I had not been a member of DOST, I would not have been aware of the online Beltline survey, and I would not have been aware of 
the open house that was held at Durham Nativity School earlier this summer. Um, what I propose is that we put a pause on adopting the master plan while we work to inf inform every resident along the planned route and also collect their opinions and questions. If 100% of residents sounds like an unachievable goal, then maybe we need to re-examine our vehicles of outreach. Um, if we mail questionnaires to every residence um, along the route, even if the response rate isn't 100%, we will have informed elderly residents who lack access to the internet of a major change that is being proposed. This questionnaire could have the address of a website on which residents could upload videos themselves talking about concerns. We could even include a number to call in for the less technically inclined that would be manned during specific hours of the day. Uh, my, my concern is that we need authenticity to ensure equity. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Gorman. Jen McDuffie. Evening all, I'm Jen McDuffie, 4121 Settlement Drive, Durham. I belong to lots of groups in this town. I think they're probably on either side of this issue. So I'm speaking as a private citizen who thinks that this can be a both and. Because we can have community input and accept the master plan and not hold up the process of something that we've been working on already for 10 years. The trail is important for physical activity, for alternative forms of transportation, to make bike commuting safer, and to increase green space. Ensuring adequate community input is important for equity, for innovation, because some of our best ideas come from ordinary citizens, and for the common good of all of our citizens. But the point is that we have time for both. Because I remember the 20 years it took to get the bridge over I-40, because I worked on it for 15 of those years. And we're only at the master plan stage. The master plan can be changed down the road as they start to do the design work, as we get more input from the community. One of the organizations I work with is the Partnership for Healthy Durham. We do intense community input gathering for a community health assessment we write every three years. We know how to do this. So we can be gathering more input <coughs> while they do the design. We can even put down the basic asphalt trail because there isn't any question about how we do that. It's a rail bed. We can't move it. It's going to be there. And we don't have any money for any of these amenities anyway. We only have the money for the design work and the basic trail bed. So I think this can be a both and. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from Andrea Muffin Hudson. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, I'm Andrea Muffin Hudson. I live at 322 Junction Road, um, Durham, North Carolina, 27703. Um, if I was not on the CIP, if I wasn't a board member, I wouldn't have known that there was going to be a belt line. Um, and I work downtown, I work everywhere, and I'm in all different type of communities and people that I have spoken to have not been aware. But with that being said, um, those prices I saw up there, those millions of dollars, can we use that for our public school system as opposed to this bike, this? belt line right now, let's just make it a moment because I want it to be equitable and I want it to be fair. And we're already being displaced already. So with that being built, it's <coughs> going to displace even more of us that are already being displaced by the gentrification that's happening now. That's just going to increase the number. Um, so if you can please just put a pause on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to now call the other people that have signed up to speak. And if you all would come in this order, that would be great. Brett Stanfield, Stangefield? Oh, hey, Brett. Can you work on your handwriting? Uh, <laughs> Pamela Hayward, Hayward Rattini. I'll work on my handwriting if you work on the trail. <laughs> uh, Justin Robinson. Mariah Monsanto. Tia Hall. Angel Dower, Heidi Hannipal, and Fleming Talton. 
Okay. Uh, you each have two minutes. If you could state your name and address. And I was just messing with you. You know I love you. Um, my name is Brett. I'm at 6 Jewa Valley, Durham, North Carolina. Um, I would implore the council to take a few steps to ensure equity. Um, number one is to recognize that the precedents um, that were laid out by the uh, store company are not um, a good comparison uh, to a city like Durham, given the size of Atlanta, New York, Chicago, and the effects um, of gentrification on cities like those that vastly, that displaced a lot of residents could be even greater in a small city like Durham. Uh, number two is to conduct a survey and workshops that is hosted by the city as opposed to the store company to ensure that uh, race, income, and length of tenure in Durham uh, is covered um, and representative of the population of Durham. Um, to make public um, as best you can to your ability who has pledged private funds and committed private funds to the process already and who also does moving forward. Um, and to also make public, public and vacant space that the city uh, currently has or plans to acquire in order to do uh, affordable housing in the adjacent area of the trail. And then lastly, to commit that jobs that are a consequence of the trail, um, as well as art that will be uh, going up around the trail, go to Durham residents, especially Durham residents that fall on the lower end of the income scale. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kamala Hayward Rotini. Good evening. Good evening. I feel like I already have a win because you pronounced my first name correctly, so thank you, Mayor. Um, my name that is Kamala. That was pure luck. <laughs> My name is Kamala Hayward Road to Me. I live at 1606 P Street, Durham, North Carolina. Um, that's in Duke Park. I am also, uh, I serve on the Durham Open Spaces and Trails Committee. And I want to give a very big thank you to Durham Beltline for everybody for um, organizing everyone to come out and speak this evening. Uh, my comments are informed by my living in Durham and also my professional experience. I, I study communities, I study access to communities and their access to information as an anthropologist. Um, one of the things that stands out to me about the dorm belt line, uh, the first thing is I do believe this is uh, the possibility to be a model for not just Durham pushing forward an equitable development plan, but possibly the nation. And so I do want to thank the Durham Beltline Steering Committee and the consultants. Uh, what I do want to say, however, is that the possibility for that to be realized can only happen if all communities are heard from. So when I say all communities, I think as human beings, we generally take for granted our built environments. But we don't realize that the built environments not only um, that the places where we live, but it shapes how we live. And that's why it's important to hear from everyone. The other thing that comes up for me, I have attended some of the public meetings and I applaud the efforts to get the word out about the Durham Beltline and I do applaud the point of trying to start discussion about the um, equitable development plan. But what I will say really quickly is that the usual methods of outreach need to be expanded so that other communities that who are historically not heard can be heard in this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Justin Robinson. I'm Justin Robinson. Um, I address the 1612 South Roxboro Street. Uh, that's in the C.C. Spaulding neighborhood. Uh, I'm on the Durham Parks Foundation board, among lots of other boards. Uh, my main concern is uh, with the Durham Beltline's master plan is the part of the steering committee. Uh, uh, you know, Durham's demographics pretty well. Of the 30 people who were on the steering committee, only four of those people were people of color. 
Um, and some of the survey results were fairly troubling because, because of, the, of the, the method of funding, which is a federal TIGER grant, which is supposed to <laughs> offer ladders of opportunity for people who live in these neighborhoods, on which around the Beltline is the average, where the median income is uh, $38,500. $38, of the people surveyed, 11% of those people made less than $40,000. 22% of those people made more than $120,000. So our issue is, or my issue, is about who is this trail being built for? If, if, it, is, if, it, is, if it is being built, built to promote mobility justice, then the people who were surveyed need to look different. I don't know if the, if the materials went out in Spanish. If I had not been in the role that I am in in lots of different places, I would not have known that the Beltline was happening either. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. Mariah Monsanto. No relation. Hello, um, council members. Um, I'm here to ask you also to pause um, of approving this plan. I'm here as a community member. Um, I live at 517 North Guthrie Avenue. A white dude from Georgia owns my house. Um, I say that to say um, I share qualities, um, three qualities at least, that none of the people who presented on Durham Beltline that are doing this qualify with, which means I'm a resident, I'm black, and um, yeah, I also didn't know about it. So um, I just find it very ironic that people who are not living in Durham and breathing in Durham are creating for Durham. Um, I work downtown for multiple organizations. If I wasn't walking around downtown and didn't see um, a sign about a, a public forum for this. I would not have known about the Durham Beltline being built. Um, outside of that, I say that to say um, I would hate for um, Durham City Council to continue to support um, development for residents that do not live in Durham. Um, I, can't, I only live in here for about three and a half years, and I've seen the demographic change greatly in terms of the population you see in Durham, the people you see um, developing Durham, they don't look like the residents here. Um, so things like um, saying that there's possibilities, I need tangible things that are actually gonna happen with the people who are creating this belt line. So the possibility for affordable housing is not an option when there's not a place where people live already. Not when um, sheriffs are already, are um, and the Durham, and the Department of Transportation is already evicting um, homeless camps for people who don't have homes. And then to build something like this who has historically from places um, in Atlanta and Greensboro and New York City um, further displaced people. So the whole possibility is not a feasible option in terms of the people who already live here to be able to be, um, to, be able to live here affordably and not be displaced from their homes like they've already been have. Um, five seconds. Thank you, it's late, I'm hungry. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Monsanto. Tia Hall. No. Hi, good evening. I, I'm Tia Hall, and I live at 306 Gray Avenue in the Cleveland Holloway neighborhood. I want to read a brief uh, bit from Policy Link. A more equitable city is one where all residents, regardless of race, ethnicity, nativity, gender, or neighborhood of residents, are fully able to participate in the city's economic vitality and contribute to the region's readiness for the future and connect to the region's assets and resources. So I better read so I can get all this in. But while, we, while the loop seems to have many accoutrements of fun and joy, does it bear the same stamp of equity for all of Durham? I love Durham. And to those we love, we owe a truth-telling, a reckoning. We are a city that has a history that has planned for all of Durham, absent equitable input, especially for equitable enjoyment and thriving. Durham was incorporated 149 years ago, just after the end of slavery. And at that time, one of, out of three residents were enslaved. Black and non-white community members were relegated via redlining uh, policies to historically divested spaces. Those this was practiced by banks, real realtors, and lawmakers. And the practice started in 1937, yet we still see the remnants of those today. 
going to skip forward. But what I want to say is right now, we have a moment to stop and fully engage all of Durham in an equitable manner. We, Durham, should do our very best to make sure that the most vulnerable communities are richly engaged in this development process. We, Durham, should do the very best to eliminate and mitigate racial disparities and displacement and build towards a readiness for the future. Let's do our very best to assure that all residents are fully able to participate in the vitality of Durham's growth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Angel Dower. My name is Angel Dozier. Sorry. And I live at 815 South Roxborough Street. No problem. Um, I have lived in Durham for 19 years. I raised my 26-year-old son here. I started my first business here and my second business and my third business here. And I started an organization called Be Connected Durham, which addresses disparities and fosters equity among audiences within this community. Uh, the vision statement here um, for the Durham Beltline Master Plan says that the Beltline will be a vibrant green space community, I'm sorry, a vibrant green space connecting communities to the heart of Durham. Goal number four says that <coughs> this project will enhance and preserve communities along the trail. Ms. Dozier, could you pull back just a little from the microphone? Yeah, that way we'll be able to hear you. The teacher thing. Golden, do I get my time back? You, I'll, I'll work on that. Okay. <laughs> um, goal number four says that this, will, this plan will enhance and preserve communities along the trail and ensure equitable access. But if people are displaced within their communities, goal number four, goal number three, to improve quality of life. Goal number two, to engage, to be innovative, to provide something that's uniquely Durham. And goal number one, which provides key connections to a variety of users, not all users, here in Durham, will not happen. Uh, there will be residual effects in terms of the commercial properties that will be developed as a result of this. And uh, this will not be, these goals will not be met authentically. I am also here to ask you to pause the plan as is and to engage the community more authentically. J.J. Henderson, for example, is, I believe, one of the second largest elderly housing communities here, and that does not represent Durham um, in terms of the, the marginalized people who don't have the confidence or the knowledge, information, access to be here and speak on behalf of um, themselves. So I ask that this be paused. Thank you, Ms. Dozier. Thank you. Heidi Hannibal. Hi, Heidi Hannibal, 2404 Prince Street. I'm also showing up tonight as a proud participant in the Durham Beltline for Everybody and asking council to consider pausing on this, the, this plan. Um, I've lived in the city for 20 years, had DPS help me raise four kids. I feel very proud of the city and all that it does, its creative energies. I think we have an opportunity here to really think about how we're proceeding on this particular project. I'm involved in land conservation professionally, and even having that background, the Beltline Trail experience has been a very new and recent um, understanding for me. I was not aware of all of the activities that have been going on for the last 10 years, and the presentation tonight was really helpful. Um, I appreciate the work that's gone into that, but I think that we have a moment now in which we need to take a pause and ensure that we put equity at the front of this project. One more point I'd like to make is simply that um, as a resident here for 20 years, watching the city develop under the pressures that it's in currently, it is, is hard on the heart. Um, I feel that part of Durham's soul is starting to seep away. And I worry about the, the neighborhoods that we haven't properly invested in, that we haven't spent our energies on. 
the neighborhoods that have also had certain environmental impacts on them. That's part of the work that I'm doing right now. I'm engaged in a project with other community members, some of whom in this room, and feel very proud of the work that we are doing, putting process before a project and ensuring that we're understanding where we all are and how we can work together in improving our city. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Hannaford. Fleming Talton. Mr. Talton, please state your address along with your name because it's not on your card here. Uh, yes, sir. Fleming Talton, uh, 1604 Greenleaf Street in Durham. Um, I, I'm really excited about the potential for the trail and I, um, I'm very interested in the, in the community input as far as, 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 particularly as it pertains to affordable housing. I attended the uh, workshop with Mr. Nathaniel Smith in which we um, explored a lot of the history of Durham um, and how it is manifest now in, in our policies and our procedures. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't come with uh, much prepared in terms of what to say because I, I looked at the uh, Durham Beltline for everybody website, uh, poured over the website trying to figure out exactly what the methodologies or end goals um, of the proposals are. And uh, I, I can't, I, I don't quite understand why the pause is necessary. So, you know, to get straight to the point, I, I am in favor of drafting the, uh, the master plan. Um, I, I don't understand the length of the pause um, or why we need to obstruct the timeline in order to get um, adequate community feedback. I feel that there is uh, plenty of time in the current timeline as it, as it exists to uh, pursue those ends. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Is there anyone else present here who would like to speak on this item at this point tonight? Anyone else? Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to declare the public hearing closed, and we will now uh, discuss this at the council. Council members, questions and comments? Uh. Mr. Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, is there somebody who has worked on this master plan who can help us with a definition of master plan? Because I, I feel a little bit... Um, I feel a little bit like there is some um, misunderstandings about what this plan is and what it's intended to be and like at what point, what stage in the project we're at. And my kids have been watching a lot of Animaniacs and so I immediately, when I hear the word master plan, I'm like, pinky on the brain. <laughs> Time to take over the world. And, but that level of detail is not what we're talking about right now, I think. So just more of like a, a context for what exactly this document is intended to do in terms of where we are in the process and moving forward. In the Before you answer that, I just want to say that I totally <laughs> missed that cultural reference. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the city manager doesn't know either, and afterwards you can tell us about it. All right, yeah. If, if you grew up in the 90s, Steve, you would... It, it's lost on right me there. as well. And I grew up in the 90s. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, okay. And well, Council I can say Austin's it. even younger than you are, but I, for your information, I grew up in the 50s. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. Let's say, well, you know, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, you know, what do we plan to do uh, this this Monday night? The same thing we plan to do every other Monday night. Take over the world. <laughs> Let's discuss time. these issues. <laughs> uh, take over the world. Uh, no, the master plan document was set to um, give a general premise of what the vision and objectives of the, the plan would be um, based on the, the funding that was provided uh, the goals were to uh, work on the community involvement side and hear what people thought uh, and what their values were, what they wanted to see in the plan, but then to begin to set up, to set up the design concepts for the plan as well um, and some uh, conceptual designs. Um, what we wanted to do was first establish uh, an idea for the cost of the project, what type of cross-sections are you going to have, um, the different users that would be there. Um, as uh, Jackie and Jake had discussed, when we heard in the first public meetings, we heard time and time again from pretty much all the stakeholders across the board and, and from surveys that 
Um, the original plan for this project was to almost be an extension of the Amer American Tobacco Trail through uh, downtown and around the north side, but across the board we heard it really needs to be a whole lot more than that, and it can't just be a trail. It needs the steering committee and, and stakeholders really said, you know, this needs to be almost a linear park. This needs to be a signature facility in the in the uh, project. So, our goal is to set that design and then to also begin to set up some of the ideas for how do we implement design and move this uh, process on beyond just the conceptual design and actually into engineering uh, later on down the line. It's, I think Mr. Bellamy may have some more comments on that as well. Yes, you, you hit it for the first Terry, will you introduce oh, yourself? Me. Terry Bellamy, Director of Transportation, City of Durham. Um, the, the process that we're in when you say master plan is that it's the beginning of the communication with the community. So in each phase, there's more and more outreach and communication. This is only to give us that snapshot in time. The next phase that you will go to would be the design, as Todd uh, basically uh, indicate, but then there's again community outreach and what we heard through the process is that is more and more community outreach as we go to the next phase. As they mentioned, this is a Tiger Grant funded project. So what this project can only be used for is for the transportation component. The other pieces to it, which is a part of the master plan, would be other funds that come from someplace else. Our objective is to do the, the transportation piece, which is the trail. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you. That's helpful. I, 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 some, I'm just going to say some other things I want to say, which is that the, I would be very much in favor of there being an, a more detailed equity plan in place um, as we move forward into the further phases of this project. But again, I want to emphasize the reason that doesn't exist is because there is no detail. Like the, this plan is not a detail plan. It's not an implementation plan. Like we're not there on any of that. So, um, so I'm excited about all of the um, all of the things that are being recommended, um, including you know building our equity plan first before we move into a design plan, doing more extended outreach, um, the thoughts around affordable housing, local hiring, racial equity analysis and racial equity lens. Um, I, I am fully in favor of all of those ideas. I don't, I, I think where, where I'm lost is why that requires a pause. And I also don't think we ever, I, I don't think this is gonna move quickly. Like, like trans, building projects, transportation projects, um, these, are, these are not fast moving things, right? Like it's not, we're, we're looking at several years before anything is on the ground. So, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that adopting the master plan is going to in any way, in any way conflicts with any of the goals that I have around, uh, around building the equity plan that is, around, around putting more details into the thoughts around equity that are in the master plan. Um, and I would 100% support doing those things in advance of a design phase, for example. Um, but the other thing that I want to say, and I, I get stressed about it, but a pause and an equity plan, like I, I don't want to, I don't want to overpromise. Like that will not stop displacement. There is very little. The only thing that will stop displacement is not building this. And I am act honestly, I'm like willing to consider that. I'm not like 100% gung-ho, we need to move forward with this plan. Um, but there is no way to actually stop displacement in the economic context that we exist in if we are going to build infrastructure like this. It is necessarily going to, like that is what it does. That is, we are in, the city is growing, there's gentrification, we, you know, we, have a market for housing, something that every human being needs, and we buy it and sell it like it's a commodity, right, on a market. So there, there isn't an equi equity plan in the universe that's going to solve that problem. So I want to say, while, I, while I'm completely support us doing all these things and we should do all these things, there is a limit to what the city can do to have an impact and solve these issues. And we can do whatever we... We should do whatever we can do, but again, if we're going to build this, it is going to have an impact, and 
and that's that that is an economic reality that I think we all need to be going into we need to be going into this with our eyes open about that like that is just a fact of where we are right now that's all thanks thank you very much council members council member Freeman uh, I want to start with a quote because I, I know uh, someone else shared a quote that kind of made me think about it and put it into context and, and just recognizing that True community is based upon equity, mutuality, and reciprocity. It affirms the richness of individual diversity, as well as the common human ties that bind us together. And that's Pauli Murray. And just acknowledging that when the community stands up to say that they need a pause, there's usually some history, some background, and some issues that have arisen that have created a a kind of agita about what's coming that is real. And so I feel like we're talking about these plans in a very flat sense. It's the reason why we set up the way we are. We do the consultants, we do the plan, the master plan, the design phase, and all of the engagement after. And this is how the system has been set up. And everyone in this room knows that that system is set up to create the displacement. But if we're all going to sit here and say, that's the way it's set up, we have to move along with it, it's not going to stop. And so my concern, which I raised at that event with Nathaniel Smith the other night, is that as much as we're all progressives around this dais, and as progressive as our city is, it's not that we don't have the tools or the political will or the wherewithal to do it, it is that we have to recognize that these are systems and institutions in place to prevent that. There are, there's not going to be a lever that lets you stop it. We have to make it stop. And so if that means creating a pause in the process so that we can evaluate what an equitable plan looks like and it actually looks at race and gender and ability and disability, like those things should have came first. Recognizing there's a tiger grant, I mean, I understand the context of all of these things in a municipal government, but there is still room for us as a council to make these adjustments. The same way in which we just went, I mean, I'm going to keep repeating it because it's the same thing. You just did it with the, public, with the public versus charter conversation. You created a way to prevent the charter school from having funding. Plain and simple. They will not have nonprofit status on their funding for their building. You created that based on your will. You can do the same thing in this equitable development. If you don't, it's not going to occur. So yes, that Tiger Grant funding is there. Yes you, you, yes, you can approve the master plan as it is, or you can place a pause on it and say, we need to figure out how to build in equity first and actually mean it. I want to also add that. I made a couple of notes. I won't go through them all. It's kind of late. But if our plan does not include conversations that are had on how these Tiger grants are applied for with planning, transportation, stormwater, and workforce and economic development, the folks who are here are going to continue to be here in outrage and kind of like what's happening because they're not seeing how it all ties together. It's, our, it's, our, it's on us to make sure that they understand it. And so recognizing that, yes, the, I think it was Diane Standards who, with our um, Human Relations Commission who's pointing out like 2%, 2% of what the city send, sends out and into the communities for black-owned or minority-owned businesses. We have to be consistent in recognizing that this racial equity conversation is more than just a conversation. It's more than just plans. It is actual people being displaced. It is actual... Um, actual life happening that is creating a situation where everyone feels like it's all pit against them. It's not just, about, it's not just by race. It is, it is because these systems impact us all in a very similar way. They're oppressive. We just need to be consistent and actually use our power to, to actually undo that. Thank you. Thank you. Comments? Any other comments, questions? I have some comments. 
Um, I'll just say that I appreciate very much everyone who came tonight uh, to talk about this. And I think that the issues that were raised, the equity issues, if you ever come to a Durham City Council meeting or a work session, you know that those are the issues that are on the top of this council's agenda every time. And so I'm very appreciative of you all raising the issues again tonight. And we need to be made constantly aware of them. And it was good to hear you. I'll say that I've advocated for us getting this trail funded for a long time. I pushed for it in the capital improvement plan. I was overjoyed that I could uh, help make the connection between the conservation fund and our city administration so we could get this job done. Uh, it's really been years of strategizing about how to shake the trail loose from Norfolk Southern. Um, Norfolk, Southern Norfolk Southern had a, a death grip on this land uh, and uh, we worked, tried to work through their board of directors. Um, we had dueling appraisals and finally uh, with the help of the Conservation Fund, and I see David Proper here in the back, and David, I just want to thank you for the work you did. It would not have been possible to acquire the land without your help. Uh, your ability to move quickly and provide capital uh, and to make this possible and to acquire, acquire the site, uh, which we will be uh, now purchasing back from you. So I just want to thank you and the Conservation Fund, and I want to thank our staff, uh, Dale, um, I know that for you, uh, this green infrastructure, as this, these trails are a labor of love, and they've made a tremendous difference in the life of our city. Um, you know, what's the best thing in Durham? You know, it's probably the American Tobacco Trail. Um, and the work that our staff has done on these trails has been fabulous and uh, very difficult. In addition to which, it's been really hard to get the funding together to, to make this purchase. So um, we're, uh, we've, we've had to not only put up a lot of our own local funds, but we've had to do a lot of prioritizing. So let me just explain it like this. The state transportation system heavily favors roads, heavily. And in able to get anything else done, through the state transportation money, which is where most of the money is. It's federal money that comes to the state. We have to, Durham and our Chapel Hill and our Metropolitan Planning Organization, our goal is for 50% of the money that we spend through that system to be for things other than roads, sidewalks, trails, bicycle infrastructure. And for those of us now, Bernetta and Charlie are on the MPO. I served on the MPO for quite a while. And we tried to keep those priorities foremost in our mind. This is the kind of infrastructure that we want because we believe it creates a healthier community and we actually and we believe it is the only path to a livable future for our city and our planet, but particularly for our city. And so this is a, I believe, an absolutely key project and I believe for all the reasons uh, that they have been cited in the in the master plan and by many, many people over many years, this can be like the American Tobacco Trail, a crown jewel for Durham. I have a, a very personal connection to the trail. My great-grandfather, Elias Shul, uh, came over from the old country, fleeing the czar, and got off the boat in Baltimore. Um, and we was met by the representatives of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And they sent him with a pack of dry goods down to a little town of Virginia, Lynchburg, where they said he could sell his dry goods and he could also cut meat. He was a kosher butcher for the Jewish community in Lynchburg. You can imagine it was a very small Jewish community in 1896. But every week, once a week, he rode down on the train from Lynchburg, came down through Roxborough and on into Durham on what is now the Beltline to cut meat for 
the cigar rollers that James B. Duke had brought down from New York, the Jewish cigar rollers. So I've always been interested in this line and felt a kind of personal connection to it that I haven't felt to all the other trails or potential trails. So I've been engaged with it for a really long time. And but I was when I, I sat down this weekend and read the entire master plan in a lot of detail, and I, I think I engaged with it at a level that I hadn't before I know I did. And I want to say to the uh, consultants and to staff that I think it's a very impressive and comprehensive piece of work. I think you guys did a great job on it. Um, I have a few questions um, that I want to ask, and, um, and then I have a little bit more of a statement to make about where I think, what, what I think we ought to do in terms of the timing and the equity and so forth. So uh, I'll ask these questions uh, first. Uh, the description of the funding, and this may be for Terry uh, or for someone in the administration as much as the consultant, um, how, how much of the funding do we have now in hand, or we'll be voting on tonight, actually later, uh, for the right-of-way purchase, building the trail, and providing the basic necessities? Uh, Bill Judge, transportation, um, through uh, federal funds, through the state, and as well as uh, through the CIP that City Council has allocated, we have basically the funds necessary to uh, do the design, to acquire the right-of-way, and um, for a large portion of the construction, we don't have all of the construction dollars yet, but we think we have some strategies for some additional federal money that we think we can. That would be for the transportation component, though, of the trail, basically just building um, the cross-section that you saw in the master plan none of the linear park amenities, all that would have to be future parks and rec funds, private funds, combination, something else. So um, the, uh, the the cross-section, this would include the cross-section that we saw in the... Uh... It, yes. Okay. And, uh, but we don't have all the construction funds for that yet? Not all of them, but we, like I said, we think through some other federal funds that we, we have a strategy where we think we can help close that gap. And what would the time table, what would the, what kind of time frame would you see that operating on as a judge? Um, we would anticipate the uh, starting the design of the trail component since that is fully funded in the next few months after the master plans adopted in the supplemental municipal agreement um, through our general services with the expectation that we would have that construction funding component resolved by the time that the design would be complete, approximately, yeah, within the next year and a half, two years to start construction. Design would be complete in the next year and a half, two years, and we would hopefully then have the funds for the construction, not of the amenities, although I guess fundraising on that would also be proceeding at a similar time, but for the transportation uh, uh, structure alone. Is that true? Uh, Correct, for the transportation component. Okay. Um, okay, so thank you. So that, those are my questions. Um, let me just go on to talk just a little bit about the, the, uh, the, equity, anal the equity analysis. And I appreciate uh, you all involving, uh, the consultants involving Kofi Boone, uh, who is um, a real asset in this way and uh, appreciated the, the, uh, the recommendations that were included uh, concerning the Great Loop and, and, and other ones. Um, so I, I will say that we all know that in addition to getting the funding together for this project, the equity issues are the ones that are going to be central to the trail's success. Uh, gentrification has already come to most of the neighborhoods that the trail will be passing through. And I want to add a little something to what, uh, what Mayor Pro Tem Johnson said, which is, she says, if we build this, there will be gentrification. What I want to say is, whether or not we build this, there is already gentrification. I do believe that uh, 
those neighborhoods, that gentrification is, has come and is coming to those neighborhoods, regardless of what we do in terms of this infrastructure. That's true for our entire city, and that's a reality that we need to face. The question is, what do we do in the face of that? Market forces are real. People are moving to Durham, and as many of the people described um, from our podium today, uh, Durham is becoming less affordable, and we have very ambitious affordable housing plans that are still not going to do the job, and can, we can never subsidize our way out of the situation that we are in. But we can make a difference. We can make a difference. And in this case, one of the things that we can do is target some of our affordable housing efforts around this trail. And I think that's a very conscious decision that we can make. Um, we can't control what the landowners on Avondale Drive are going to do. But there are things that we can do. There are incentives that we can offer. And uh, there are things that we can do in terms of, uh, of density bonuses and uh, some of the things that we read in the report and that we also know were possible from other, other affordable housing work. So while I believe that green infrastructure and any infrastructure uh, accelerates gentrification, in this case, the gentrification is accelerating at a rapid clip on its own, and that's not going to change barring a major recession in this country. So we can't stop the market forces, but let's do everything we can to make a difference in terms of stabilizing these neighborhoods, both for the long-term low-income homeowners that live there and for renters. So I'm going to propose to my colleagues um, I'm going to propose this to my colleagues. I, I think that uh, this is a good time to adopt the master plan. The master plan is just that. It's a master plan. And as I think people have said today, um, we, uh, we, we have a long way to go uh, even before the first piece of asphalt is laid down. You heard Mr. Judge saying we're talking a couple of year, year and a half, a couple of years before that happens. We are going to be in a pause. So I'm going to suggest to my colleagues the following, that we adopt the master plan and that we ask our administration to come back to us. I'm going to suggest the time of 90 days with not an equity plan, because you can't do an equity plan in 90 days, but to tell us how we are going to create an equity plan and what the outlines of that will be. And that will include how we're going to engage the community, and when I talk about the community, I am particularly talking about individuals that live along the corridor, and I would say every individual that lives along the corridor needs to be heard from. And what are the other components, what are the other components of an equity plan that we want to create? Now, I'm, I think what we mostly want there is to know what the process and the timeline should be. Um, I said equity components, but I think that most of those components are actually going to have to come from the next phase. We're going to be listening to the community for those components. We know what a lot of them would, will be. Affordable housing, for example, will be, but will be one. Uh, but there will be others, and we want to hear from the community what they are. So again, I'm going to suggest that we adopt the master plan and that we ask our administration to come back to us in 90 days, and I'm open to hearing from the administration about the, how much time that should be, uh, with what and uh, what good equity planning for this trail will be like, the best equity planning for this trail will be like, uh, to bring us back a process for that that will, in, will, in, will involve the level of community engagement that I think we all want and expect. So those are my, I'm sorry for my overlong comments, everybody, uh, but that's my, that's my, uh, that's my, my, that's my suggestion. Comments, questions? Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions? Sure. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to thank everybody who's stuck around with us this long tonight. Um, you're part of the best of what our city 
is and wants to be. Uh, I promise we didn't try to wait y'all out. That's not what happened. Um, it, it, the other stuff earlier in the evening took a little longer than I think any of us wanted it to or thought it might, um, so here we are. Um, I think the mayor has a perfectly reasonable uh, path forward. Um, I just wanted to make sure that folks understood from me, uh, and I know that uh, my colleagues agree, that um, if you didn't think we had received the message before tonight, we have absolutely positively received the message tonight. And I want to make sure folks understand exactly what I mean when I say that. Um, I think I am going to be focused on making sure that staff is accountable for delivering that plan that the mayor talked about that has the level of community engagement that we all deserve for a project like this. Um, I think the mayor's laid out the right parameters for that uh, in trying to reach every person that lives adjacent uh, to this corridor and to engage them not only to give them information about what the project is, could be, um, but also to ask them what they think the project ought to be and look like. And I think that will at least be a start. Um, the other thing I want to make sure folks understand, and I don't mean to put too fine a point on this, but um, I think part of the reason I, I heard folks asking for a pause was so that we could make sure to get this piece right before we started doing anything else with the project. Is that a fair assessment? I think the only way that I can be comfortable voting for the master plan tonight, um, knowing that that's gonna happen, is that I am accountable to each and every one of you. You can hold me accountable. If this thing starts to get built out and it's not what we wanted it to be, hold me accountable. If we start to move toward a 90-day plan that you think is missing A, B, and C parts, reach out to me, talk to me, I'll, try, I'll be reaching out to you. But if we approve a, a, an equity plan as the mayor laid out that doesn't have the right level of community engagement, the right way to do it, encourage, encompasses all the issues that we want, hold me accountable. That's how I will make sure that I approach this with the right sense of urgency, plus I love our city just as much as you do and want to get it right. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, go ahead, Mayor. Council, Council Member Caballero and then Council Member Mintz. So um, this is something that I, whereas earlier I didn't had no conflict on how I was going to vote um, when we were all having a lively discussion. Uh, this is something I'm actually very torn about because I sat on DOST before I became a council member. It was one of the commissions that was open and out of all the descriptions, it's, I, I love uh, the trail system. I live right near the LB Creek Trail. This trail in particular will be a huge asset to my family. It means we might be able to just go down to one car. So on a personal note, I'm very much an advocate, and I think that for me, I will hear our community, and I do actually believe that we should have a pause specifically because of the DOST members who came out. It's We are uh, sworn in. Our, we, we are supposed to be advocating for trails when so many of you all came out and asked for that, that that really resonated with me. So I just wanted to share how I'll be voting. Thank you. Th yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I know why you want us to pause, uh, because we've been hurt before. And we've seen this movie before, and we've had our hearts broken, and many of us feel that our city, or the heart of our city, this city, um, is changing. But, and I want to echo, I commend uh, my colleagues for what I thought were brilliant comments, and I appreciate all the comments from all of you, you residents and citizens. But you elected us to make hard decisions. Um, and if we don't make them, you're free to excuse us and find another group to make them. Um, you didn't really elect us to pause. You elected us to walk and chew gum at the same time and to do things. Um, in my reckoning, if we take the pause to its logical conclusion, we should stop voting on everything until we have an equity plan. Um, and I just, don't, I just don't think that's practical. Uh, with respect to the staff, the, the staff has done an amazing job 
And I, I would just respectfully put to my colleagues that the staff really can't answer the questions that we were elected to answer. <laughs> The staff cannot take the place of our political will, what, what we approve and what we don't approve. The staff cannot uh, preempt us from deciding what we do with city-owned land. That, that, that buck stops here. Um, so I, I think uh, Mayor Pro Tem kind of echoed this earlier. I don't want to create false um, uh, uh, hopes or expectations of the staff. Um, the buck stops here, and the decisions will be made uh, here. I want to also make sure that when, what we're tasking the staff with, so I want to draw a distinction between an equity plan and a communication plan. Uh, we are, as the city, are about to impanel an actual racial equity task force that's going to have a year to do their work. And um, you know, I don't want to ask the staff to do in 90 days what we're asking a task force to do in a year. Um, so I just, you know, if if we're coming up with a plan to to get more input from the community. Uh, then perhaps we ought, we ought to call it a communication or an engagement plan, but to call it an equity plan uh, in 90 days, um, uh, I, I just want to be clear, make sure that we're clear with what we're tasking the staff to do. This staff has listened to us ad infinitum. They know our heart. They know we care about affordable housing. They know we care about using uh, publicly owned land, city owned land to do affordable housing. They know how we feel about uh, 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 stuff. They've listened to us. Um, I'm just, I just want to be clear, make sure that we don't, we're not ambiguous or we're, we're, we're not clear on what exactly the work product is 90 days from now while we've got another group of people working on the same issue, univer same issue universally that they have a year to do. Um, and what that looks like, I don't know, but I, I, I would just, uh, I, I support moving forward with the master plan. I'm going to vote to move forward with the master plan. I'm confident that we have enough time to do these things at the same time. Uh, but I also want to make sure that um, what we're clear, what we're expecting to have in, in 90 days uh, from the staff. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. That was a, I really appreciate that. Uh, that's a great um, clarification, I think. Yes, I, I think that what we would, here, I will try to state what I think we would like from our staff, and then you guys can help me out, okay? Um, I would I would state that what we would like from our staff in the next 90 days is um, an engagement plan, uh, uh, a plan for how we plan to engage the community, uh, and um, uh, the uh, what we plan to do with that information, how we plan to engage the community, what we plan to do for that with that information. Anyone like to add anything or? Uh, or, or modify that? Well, since you asked, yeah. <laughs> it would be great to have some um, more information on how to address not only the communication, but also how the jobs planning going forward would look. How the jobs planning? Uh -huh. What it would look like to have more engaged uh, minority and local businesses involved in the, I mean, at least lay it out that we're going to do 25%, something that says that we're going to do this differently than it's been done in the past. I have to say that being that I took two tours of the Atlanta Beltline within the last month, I am like on edge about how fearful I am, similar to how I was about setting up a racial equity task force and setting up the participants. Like these things happen systematically. And if we don't systematically address or at least intentionally point to what we want to happen out of it, I just can't help but recognize, like a, today, I just so happened to ride under the American Tobacco um, Trail by South Roxboro in War II, actually. And seeing all that kutsu surrounding the trail, I don't see that at downtown. It's not as, it's not as covered in... We have to be really intentional about how we address this. Thank you. Yeah, so what I would say is I completely agree with you about the need for a uh, jobs plan. Uh, but what I would say is I would like to hear from the community about what that jobs plan would be. And that would also be true of the affordable housing plan. So I think what we should go for first is an engagement, a plan for engagement, how we're going to engage the community and listen to the community and come up with those goals. That would be my thought. 
With the intention of setting up. For the intention of having goals and, and, and implementing those. Exactly. So, Mr. Mayor, sir, with, with respect to nomenclature, are you, you're amenable to um, using engagement plan as opposed to race equity? Am I no, an engagement plan that will create communication. An engagement plan with the aim of using a race equity lens. I would say that we want an engagement plan that's going to allow us to create with the community a racial equity plan for this for this bellwether. And, uh, and, I, and I'll accept a motion to that effect. So moved. Second. And then we can discuss it more, Council Member Freeman. We have a motion on the floor. I'm trying to move this towards midnight. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, got two I just, more items, y'all. I'm yep. missing my I'm missing my racial equity task force meeting th this evening. Um, I want to be clear and also sharing with the community and those who I know. Someone mentioned they didn't understand why there would be a pause. Someone um, and a couple of folks kind of saying, "What would be the p reason for the pause?" Recognizing that throughout history, things have occurred like redlining, like 147 through Hayti, the same thing has been occurring with the green infrastructure across the country. And, rec and recognizing how race equity works in order to have impact on the very mo the most vulnerable population of people who have been impacted by things like redlining and the 147 um, highway through Hayti. It is, it is really like looking at who's been, who's been the target of the benefit for a project through, through the government and who's been the recipient of the hurt. And understanding that if you can create a system or create a process that looks at how we don't put that negative impact on people of color, then you'll create a system or a process that will actually level out a little bit better than it has in the past. And I'll just leave it at that. Councilmember Freeman, thank you. We now have a motion on the floor, and that motion is that we accept the master plan and that we, that we approve the master plan and that we create an engagement process for the purpose of uh, giving us a roadmap for a racial equity plan uh, for this belt line. We have a motion and a second on the floor. I'm going to ask that the Clerk, please open the vote. I'm going to add one more thing. And that the administration bring this to us in 90 days. I'm sorry, I forgot that part. Close the vote. The motion passes 6 to 1 with Javier Caballero voting no. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of those of you all who are here. I just want to say one more time. You can, we are totally committed to equity in this project, and we will work very hard to make it real. And uh, we know that you will be holding us accountable for that. We know that's part of our job, and we look forward to it. So thank you for being here tonight, for all the passion that you've brought to it. Thanks also to those people who are here tonight because you've worked for the last 20 years to try to create this trail. Uh, we appreciate you as well. We're very grateful for you. Thanks, everybody. We'll now move on to item item what do we move on to Doug? Item thirty three. Consolidated annexation plan Garrett Road. Thank you. Consolidated annexation plan for Garrett Road, and we will hear from staff. Good evening. Excuse me one second. I'm gonna um, uh, folks, I'm going to ask those of you all who are um, not going to be staying for this to uh, please take the conversations outside so we're able to uh, hear our staff. Thank you very much. Good evening. Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Request for Utility Extension Agreement Voluntary Annexation Zoning Map Change received from Dale, Dan Jewell for two properties totaling approximately 6.047 acres <laughs> located at 3736 and 3738 Garrett Road. Um, the annexation petition, case BDG 170005, brings one of the parcels into ex the existing city limits. 
The subject site is presently zoned residential suburban 20. The applicant is requesting a zoning designation of plan development residential 3.969, which is consistent with the future land use map designation of low density residential or four dwelling units per acre or less. Approval of the annexation petition and zoning would become effective on September 30th, 2018. Uh, key commitments on the development plan associated with the, this request, a maximum of 24 single-family residential units, uh, northbound left turn lane on Garrett Road at, site, at the site access, and additional asphalt for a bike lane. Staff has received two additional proffers which have been reviewed and found to be acceptable. These include uh, prior to the issuance of the first certificate of occupancy, the developer will provide a one-time $18,000 donation to the City of Durham Dedicated Affordable Housing Fund. And prior to the approval of the final plat, uh, the applicant will make a contribution to the Durham Public Schools in the amount of $2,500. Uh, the Public Works and Water Management Departments have determined that the existing water and sewer mains have the capacity for the proposed development. Uh, the Budget and man uh, Management Services the um, department determined that the uh, proposed annexation will become revenue positive immediately following annexation. Additional information can be found in the staff report. The Durham Planning Commission at their May 8th, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 11 to zero. Staff determines that these requests um, are consistent with the comprehensive plan policies and ordinances um, three motions would be required for this application. The first is um, required by law to approve the utility extension agreement and voluntary annexation petition. The second is to adopt the consistency statement. And the third would be for the zoning ordinance. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. You have heard the report of staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions or comments from the council. Questions or comments? Councilmember Freeman? Just for clarity's sake, this is filling in the donut hole, so to speak? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sunyak, uh, could you <coughs> repeat the, there, there's a proffer, uh, I heard the proffer for the affordable housing, $18,000, the public schools, $2,500, which I guess is $500 per student added. And is there a proffer concerning the sidewalk offsite? No. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I don't see anyone signed up to uh, speak on this item, but I assume that's wrong. Mr. Jewell, are you planning to speak on this item? Maybe I missed your card. I did fill one out. Okay. Many, well, many hours ago, though. I'm sure. <laughs> I, oh, I'm sorry. Here it is. It's hiding. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yes. Uh, Dan Jewell and Robert Herrick. We have two people. Yeah. Mr. Herrick, are you here? Great. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, give each side three minutes to begin with. Will that be enough for you, Mr. Herrick? Was that yes? Okay. I'm going to be each side three minutes to begin with, Mr. Jewell. Will that be enough? And yes, then sir. And the council may have other questions for, for either of you all. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jewell, um, go ahead. Uh, just Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, I'm Dan Jewell with Coulter Jewell Thames here representing... Uh, Mr. Walker Harris, a lifelong resident of Durham and the uh, proposed developer of this property. Uh, just to reiterate, this is a proposal for a single family zoning. We, uh, even though we were not required to have neighborhood meetings, we had two neighborhood meetings. The first was organized by the Garrett Farms Community Association. They asked some questions, asked us to do a few things. We came back to them a few months later, uh, about 25 people attended, and they were all happy with the changes that we made to the plan. Uh, as you've seen, the staff is recommending approval. The Planning Commission is unanimously recommending approval. And uh, as Ms. Sunyak stated, we uh, have put two proffers forward for an affordable housing contribution, which works out to $750 per unit if all of the 24 units that this approved for are built and also the normal $500 per student for the, uh, toward the school fund. Um, 
And uh, I will we'll close it at that, <laughs> but uh, that concludes our comments, and I hope you will concur with the staff and the Planning Commission and uh, move approval of our request. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jewell. Mr. Herrick? Mr. Herrick, if you could state your name and address. Good evening. I'm Robert Herrick. I live at 3218 Winfield Drive, which is opposite of where his development is. My biggest concern is traffic. When this, we have so many schools going down that road, 8 o'clock in the morning, I cannot get out of my street to make a right-hand turn, let alone a left-hand turn. And it's gotten to the point that uh, certain times of the day, if you're going to add this, you've got two exits from the church across the street, you're going to have a whole the entire development down the road, and now you want to squeeze even more houses in there. Uh, Mr. Reese, you spoke about how uh, you don't have any decisions to make. When these people buy these properties, it has an R20 designation, and then they want to come in and change everything. They bought it at the R20, not at another one. When he first proposed this, he only proposed so many houses when he was buying it. That's what the thing was said. He's going to put so many houses in there. And then all of a sudden he comes back, he's putting all these more houses in. I just don't understand how you say you don't have any decision power. But the biggest problem is the, tra uh, the traffic. With that art development down there, and then they're going to change the intersection, which is going to make a free-flowing Garrett Road for a good portion of the time because they're going to put the bridge over. Uh, I don't understand. And the other issue I have is just roads in general. The area is growing so much, and you've got these tiny roads. The white line on the side of the road is at the side of the road. There's no room for error when people are going in. People are constantly jogging down the road. There's Sandy Creek Park that has an entrance behind that church. And there's people there all the time. Some road improvements have to be made so that we can be able to get it out of there. I don't know if they can just take the light that it, that, that, that uh, I forget what it is, mountain road, whatever it is, and just create it so it works for two hours in the morning every five minutes so that we can get a break and get out of the street. It's, it's just kind of ridiculous. I, I literally cannot make a right-hand turn on my own street in the morning because the people are, so many people are going to that school, which brings up the charter schools because there's no busing. They're going to the charter school. There's hundreds and hundreds of cars driving down to those two charter schools. And you're going to end up with a point. I don't know what's happening at, uh, at the end, because I don't really have any information about uh, what's going to happen at Pickett and Garrett. Because with all that new construction, the entrances, there's got to be a light. There's got to be something done there. Because it, it's impossible now. The buses can't turn on there. You got buses. I sit behind a bus that cannot make a left-hand turn for 10 minutes because traffic's just that way. So something, adding more houses does not solve our problem density-wise. I mean, I understand it's fine. You have to do stuff. I'm not talking about, I said I had to see the woods go, but I know they're going to go. But it seems to me that when you start out a plan and it changes and all we do is end up with more of a mess. It's just thank you, Mr. Herrick. Too much. Thank you, Mr. Herrick. And Mr. Herrick, thank you for sticking out this long meeting. We appreciate your patience and uh, I hope you take some solace that we had to do it as well. So but we're we're grateful for you being here. Um, so uh, Mr. Jewell, do you have any comments to make on the traffic? Uh, yes, sir. I'll just refer to the staff report. Um, I know peak hour traffic is always of concerned folks. Traffic is is uh, bad almost everywhere in Durham. Uh, but the staff report did point out that the current roadway capacity of Garrett Road is 12,800 cars a day, and the latest traffic volume is 4,600 cars a day, so roughly a third. Uh, and our proposal is only adding 157 cars over the course of a day on top of the existing zoning designation. I think the problem, Mr. Herrick, is, is, is rush hour, and I understand that. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm very appreciative of your, of your concerns about that. And, and I freely acknowledge uh, that we have road needs in Durham that, are, that go unmet, uh, and uh, it's just a matter of, of, uh, t of taxes. 
and we can be doing a lot more if we want to have a lot higher taxes, and so the sidewalk would help. We are spending a lot on sidewalks. Uh, our, our capital improvement plan in the next uh, five years has us spending something like 20 or $25 million on sidewalks. Um, they're very expensive, about a million dollars a mile. Uh, but uh, but I hear you and agree with you. I completely agree with what you're saying about the need. I'm not sure where that road is on the Durham Walks plan, uh, but if you send me an email, I'll find out if it's been prioritized for sidewalk. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say I definitely agree with one thing you said, uh, which is that uh, intersection at Garrett and Pickett desperately needs a traffic light. Uh, I spent four years of my life every morning trying to make a left onto Pickett from Garrett, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, one thing I will disagree with you about, though, is I don't think I've ever said we have no decisions to make up here. I think what I was trying to explain to those folks was the decision isn't what they want it to be. <laughs> it's not the, their, the decision in that case wasn't the existing pristine nature of the property versus what the developer wanted. It's what the developer could do all on their own without us agreeing to a thing versus what the developer wanted to do. That's what I was saying, okay? Not that we don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Herrick. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Uh, I have a question for the developer. Um, has the developer offered to give away the Garrett family homestead if somebody wants to move it? I saw that mentioned in, I believe, the Planning Commission comments. Uh, yes, sir, we made that comment to the Planning Commission. So yes, the, uh, the offer is out there to all takers to either take the house or if somebody wanted to do a selective deconstruction and recycle the material, particularly the distinctive architectural features you find in a 1920s farmhouse, uh, these folks would be happy to do that. But not knowing what the timing of that might be. How, uh, long, we, how long of a timetable are you talking about for, for keeping that offer open to someone? Five, five months. Yeah, I'm going to ask you, uh, Mr. Jewell, if you would be in touch with uh, the historical pres historic preservation Absolutely. Uh, if folks and let them know about that. Uh, if you wouldn't mind doing that in the next few days, and uh, we hear you about the five months, that seems very reasonable, but I think that that would maybe give us, give them a chance to find someone who would like to preserve that historic property. So if you all would do that. Absolutely. I happen to know their, know their new executive director who they just hired. That would be great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to second the comment about the sidewalks and to figure out if there are any plans around Garrett Road, where it lies on this, um, in the timeline. Just making sure. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, um, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, is there a motion to adopt an ordinance annexing Garrett Road into the city of Durham effective September 30th, 2018? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes six. No, I'm sorry. The motion passes seven zero. Thank you. Uh, a motion to adopt a consistency statement. Move to adopt consistency statement. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Motion to uh, adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. Thank you very much. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 10, um, which was pulled from the consent agenda. Uh, and that item, I can just find it here. Contract. Contract for neighborhood bicycle routes design, TIP number C56051. Uh, and this was uh, pulled by Al Ideal Ortiz. and. Um, Ms. Ortiz, nice to see you. Uh, you have three minutes. I won't take long. Can you believe this is longer than the last People's Alliance meeting I went to? <laughs> so on the matter of item 10, I just wanted to say to avoid some of the disgruntled community 
um, folks feeling like they weren't able to be connected to the process. I just wanted to offer to the transportation department as they engage Alta planning and design that um, we would love for them to try to connect directly with PPAC and DOS members to help them get more connected to permeating into community as they pursue that planning process with that particular agency. So um, starting early so that we don't feel left out and compressed into very tight timelines. Ms. Ortiz, are you saying that you, you want the um, ALTA, the consultant, to be in contact with the, with the BPAC and the DOS members soon? Sooner oh, rather than yeah. later so that they yeah. can start getting contacts in community to do the relevant community engagement work that we've been struggling to feel like didn't happen in other places. And, and as we've been talking about tonight. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and I think staff heard that, I'm sure. Brian and Terry, yeah, thank you. I know they will and appreciate it very much. Uh, council members, uh, unless there's any other discussion, can I hear a motion on item 10? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve this contract. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Next item is item 12, Durham, Bite Line, Durham Beltline Supplemental Municipal Agreement. Mr. Mayor, uh -huh. if I could just thank Ms. Ortiz for asking my question, I, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we have two speakers on this item, Ms. Ortiz and uh, Justin Robinson. Is Justin still here? Yeah. Justin, uh, you uh, each have three minutes. Uh, Ideal, do you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Um, um, so this, this, <laughs> y'all, this is like over $10 million we're talking about, right? And so, um, what this belt line will lead to, as we've been discussing all night long, is really in our hands. And when you're spending this kind of money, you do want to get it right. And so I appreciate what the mayor has already said about the 90 day, um, window to try to get some pieces, um, worked out. Um, what I do want to say is I studied very deeply what the community engagement was for the existing master plan and for the money that was spent, that was supposed to be spent on that kind of community engagement. As an organizer, I know what I'm expected to do by the philanthropic organizations of this world um, when I'm given a certain amount of money. And I cried thinking about what was done for the price that was paid. So um, what I do want to say as we think about the money that we may engage in this process. I want to have council consider not beginning design or construction until some of these essential steps can be outlined and thinking about implementation. And here is why. A pause in what you do with the money. Somebody had said earlier something about, oh, you know, it'll be two or three years before you see something actually on the pavement. But when you think about communities and businesses and people who have been super excluded, you have to work really hard to super include them. So being super excluded requires that you super serve those same populations to make sure that they are in the pipeline um, and able to participate economically right, and as residents. Um, so the pause is because you want to make sure underrepresented businesses can actually be present as part of the building of this. So as not just a worker, but business owner, we've already cited the dismal numbers around how many minority-owned businesses can actually participate um, on projects that are city-funded. The other thing to, um, and I'm sad that the conservation fund isn't here, because one of the things that they did mention on Friday at some of the meetings with Nathaniel Smith um, and Dwayne uh, from Partnership for Southern Equity, um, an, a, a tool they have that we have been underutilizing is they don't just gather land for trails and greenways and parks, they can also gather land for economic and social justice, which means if you want to enact, uh, engage them to gather land for affordable housing or to secure land towards um, minority-owned businesses, that is also possible. That is also part of their mission. It is not outside the scope of their work. Um, and so um, one of the quotes I'll leave you with from one of the Conservation Fund staff um, on Friday, they said, oh God, were we, in, were we involved in the Atlanta Beltline? I really hope not, and they absolutely were. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I'll say is that, you know, some of the things that people have mentioned in the design uh, are basic, and then some things are amenities. And the extra money, which is supposed to come from private 
Uh, philanthropy won't touch this if they don't trust that this was done right with community in mind and at the center, especially marginalized voices. Thank you very much, Ms. Ortiz. Uh, Justin Robinson. So you've heard me before, you're gonna hear me again. I live in 1612 South Roxboro. Um, part of what I wanna address about thinking about pausing this particular thing, yes, I said pause again. Um, is about not thinking about the speculation for these kinds of projects um, already. There's speculation around the trails now that it is, folks know that it is going to be built. What we don't want to do is continue, is, is to, to think about more displacement because of speculation around this trail. What we do know from other precedent pro projects so far is that while Durham is already gentrifying, Absolutely, yes. We have not seen the level of gentrification that can happen. In the High Line, housing uh, properties, uh, housing values went up by 400%. 400%, I'm gonna say that again, so in case you didn't hear it. We have not seen the other end of what gentrification of like Durham is on its first wave. Th these other precedent projects that have happened in other parts of the country have have, has, have expedited what is already happening, uh, what, is, what is already happening in those cities and what is already happening in Durham. We have not seen its end yet. The fear is that things like the Beltline and other green infrastructure, gray infrastructure, will continue to speed us up, will add gasoline to the fire as opposed to being able to hold it back. The other thing is that was brought up earlier this evening is about uh, singing about uh, climate, climate change and having non-fossil fuel-based uh, transportation they use to get around the city. What we don't, that's true. I think we're all concerned about that. What we don't want to do is displace people now for people who might be displaced later for climate, and during climate change events. That's, I, I think our, our, our motto should be to do no harm. And in this instance, from what we have seen in other places, and thinking about the, the as thinking about the Durham Beltline as a part of a larger loop, which would be longer than the Atlanta Beltline, by the way, more miles, more mileage than the Atlanta Beltline when it's fully realized, is that we don't want to displace, displace people now for an uncertain future. That's all. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we are now. We appreciate your comments and agree with your comments. We understand the importance of this. We take it very seriously. And we're looking forward to the kind of equity plan. Uh, as I think that Ms. Collins said, people who have been super excluded need to be super in. I'm sorry, yeah. formerly Ms. Collins, I apologize, Ms. Ortiz. I knew you in another life. Ms. Ortiz, I apologize and, and Oh my God! <laughs> wow! Wow! What a world! And uh, and and uh, make it a motion. Ms. Ortiz, what you said about people being super excluded needing to be super included is absolutely right, and uh, we need to be. We need, you you should be able to depend on us to make sure that is true. So thank you. All right. Uh, I, do I hear a motion on item twelve, the approval of the supplemental municipal agreement? Move to approve. Second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7 0. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned at 11 55. That was too long. I didn't expect this to go that long. When I looked at the all the public hearings, I'm like, well, I know that a couple of them are contentious. Excited up to speed. Go pop the day and get them. I can be your no man. I have.